I'd like, just like to check in notes. We have several members of the public here. We have a leader here. Um, so, some of the others. I'm um, Robert Robin with Lawn Civic and Business. Mm -hmm. For the fountain. For the fountain, okay. And yes. Uh, Tim Bart, we're not having public comment. Public comment, okay. I'm Donna Bell Castles regarding the Trinity River Triangle Park. Okay, great. So that's the same as you? It's no. Not. No, it's not. No. different? Okay. And is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for, are you oh. here for a particular thing? Oh. Here for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, public comment. Okay. Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. I missed you. That's Thank okay. you. Are you here for public comment or no, for a particular item? The fountain. The fountain as well. Great. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And very my much. name is Stu Estes. Okay. We'll ask you again when it's your turn. I'm going to turn the uh, emceeing over to my uh, sparkly colleague, Terry Okay. So, hi. Public comment? Public, public comment, yeah. Uh, my name is Mark Warner. I'm a Northampton resident. I've also run a transportation policy and planning consulting firm for the last 22 years. I want to speak on the issue of the Rainbow Crossing, and I have two issues, both procedural and uh, one is somewhat also philosophical. Procedural one is that the Federal Highway Administration has the manual on uh, uniform traffic control devices. This is what establishes, for example, that, that uh, stop signs are red, the yield signs are yellow, and the crosswalks are white. These are not suggested guidelines. They're mandatory. You may not be aware that where other communities have sought to deviate from these guidelines, the Federal Highway Administration has told them, no, they have to desist and to change that. Now, perhaps you're imagining that this is not really a crosswalk. This proposal is really more of just a decoration. It will be next to a crosswalk. In that case, this is another, then gets into a second issue. If it is not primarily for safety and traffic flow, then I don't believe it's under your purview. And I also don't believe that this is a benign decoration. The person who came to support this is, of course, a member, an activist in the gay community, and that was what she intended with this. And when you discussed this at your last board meeting, at your last board meeting you approved it, this is what you were approving. I don't really believe that all of you are so certain that this is something that should be a symbol for our community. This is a symbol of the gay community. But is it something you really want to cast in stone permanently and in such a prominent spot in the middle of downtown as a symbol of Northampton? This is not a technical call of safety or traffic flow that should be made by the Board of Public Works or the Transportation and Parking Commission. This is a political issue that really has to come from the City Council. So I want to urge you not to take any further action on this until this has gone to the City Council, until there has been a hearing on this, and that's consistent with your own rules with regard to any sort of changes to sidewalks. I believe that would apply here, too. And that you then have broader input from the rest of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> is there any other public comment? Everyone else is here for an agenda item? For um, Trinity Road and the woman right. in turquoise like you. So is, did you... Is the meeting in order? All right, so customarily we quickly do the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, first for your approval, the minutes of the March 5th board meeting. Second. Any comments, comments? These are the ones where I had a question the last meeting and okay. they've been revised and I'm satisfied. Great. All in favor of approving the minutes as they were adjusted? Aye. 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 Second, the minutes of the March 12th BPW meeting. Did these passed muster? It took a while, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mike. Uh, all right, all in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Aye. 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 Great. Could we have a motion to take old business number three out of order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So the Trinity Row Fountain. That, that was, that was no. Or the Fountain. Fountain. Orange Fountain. Night Out. Okay. I don't know what you have. So, who wants to speak to this? I'll, I'll start, and then the people that are that are proponents for the project might want to might want to speak. Um, uh, former Councilor Tacey was in front of the board a few months ago, um, asking for the board's permission to reconstruct the Trinity Row 
fountain in Trinidad Park to put the street here. Um, I think at the time the board had said that there was a need to have a plan prepared and reviewed by staff with a recommendation to the board for approval for that project. So a lot has happened over the last few months in that regard. Um, there's been a, a professional engineer who got involved and volunteered his time in putting together some, some plans and drawings that show the intent of, of updating the, uh, basically reconstructing the, the fountain in the park. So I think um, Councilor Tacey here can speak to this a little bit more and Robert Ross from Florence Civic may have some comments about it as well, but that's sort of the summary of where we are. We had a meeting this earlier this week about the drawings. We think the drawings are in good shape and things, things are falling into place. Yeah, are I'm, you just Gene I'm, now? I'm Gene. Are you, right. just, just Gene. Just Gene. Citizen Gene. <coughs> anyway, uh, th this fountain has been, the reconstruction has been attempted twice so far and both times it hasn't, hasn't gotten off the ground yet. Uh, the last time it was uh, attempted by the Brazos, and uh, it just didn't, for some reason, that's history. But uh, <clears throat> I decided uh, we would give it a real shot, and uh, I bought a thousand bucks worth of t-shirts. And um, we had them printed up and, uh, and sold them, started selling them at the Florence Hardware Store. And uh, we were able to collect almost $4,000. We bought the t-shirts for only $10.00. <coughs> cents a piece and we sold them for fifteen dollars so that's how many t-shirts we sold it was a load and we had great great we had great response and I kept getting more and more made and uh, just we just left the money in the account <coughs> and uh, then I guess people really <coughs> realized that we were serious about it we had a fellow that lived across the street from uh, the park and he heard about it and he came right up he was the first one to make a donation of with a, a cash of two hundred dollars he just walked in to the hardware store with a check for 200 bucks for the fountain. I mean, so people really took notice and they noticed the t-shirts around. We have t-shirts all over the world. Australia, they went to New Zealand, they're all over Europe. Uh, Denmark, they're, uh, we have, we have, we have t-shirts in Iceland. Um, so anyway, it was just, I, I just couldn't understand uh, how quickly it took off and how well it went. So uh, then um, even the Florence Casket Company uh, was the ultimate donor, $11,000 from the Florence Casket Company. Um, and then from there was uh, several thousand dollars that came from Florence Civic. Um, it just it just kept going. So anyway, here we are. We finally have uh, we have enough money, um, and uh, we're dying to start it. And I know that uh, wheels sometimes grind, but that's I never expected to be able to walk onto city property and just build a fountain. I knew it was going to take, and we persevered. We stuck with it, and uh, here we are. And I want to. Um, the Sinkowitzes at the Florence Hardware Store have been absolutely fantastic, instrumental. Uh, Lori, especially, uh, she's tough. <laughs> she uh, <laughs> she's tough, but I'll tell you. She and she's the one that's the keeper of the funds. I opened the account at the North Hampton Cooperative Bank right next to the fountain, and um, I'm excited to, to start it. And uh, uh, if with this board's blessing, um, I'll have a start date. Um, on Monday. I will ha be able to tell you when we'll start on Monday. I'm not going to start on Monday. So, um, anyway, I'm excited as heck to, uh, to get it going. We used to skate on that fountain, by the way. We were kids. In the circle. In the circle. <laughs> Any, anything you want to add? Um, no, um, Gene got a great start on the fountain. Uh, the, it took a while to get the plan together. We got a neighbor, uh, um, uh, Nick Boothlet, put, put together a plan. He's a civil engineer. And, uh, talked about it the other day, we made a couple of revisions. It was an initial plan to put uh, solar um, power there, but then it's going to be very feasible for the location or kind of cost costly for, for the project, for the small scale project. But it looks pretty good to go. Excited to have it happen. So, so is the electricity metered through some municipal account? It is. St street lights or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's power in the park right now. And of course, the fountain used to run back in the day. Yeah. I'd like to add too that the city already provided a water service to the park, and they've agreed to run a water line to the fountain. And uh, the city is going to, Jimmy Malu, um, city wouldn't have much trouble running power, things such as that. So everything's in place. I got, we're ready. Bro? I was just wondering what the total amount of uh, money collected was. $17,892. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that, no sense? 
and, <laughs> have, and no pub, no, no public funds, no nothing, just yes. all private donation. And what will be the cost of the fountain? It's going to be pretty close to that. Uh, there's about uh, eleven thousand or twelve thousand nine hundred dollars worth of material, uh, and I haven't thrown the pump in there yet. And the pump from Taplin, I've gotten different prices from Taplin, and uh, I'm I'm working on it. But it'll be it'll, every penny will be documented. Um, and uh, Judy Cernak was the one. Uh, at the North Hampton Coffee Bank, and she has turned over the reins on that because she retired. So long it took to go, you know, it was in a time when it took about four years, and uh, she's retired, so I forget what the girl's name is now that is the keeper of the funds at the co-op bank. It's a non-interest bearing account. It's not a, uh, uh, a non-profit group. It's, um, there's no tax returns that are, had to be done or anything like that, so. So Jim, are you saying the department's ready to sign off on? We, we would recommend approval of the, of the project. We have a set of plans that we received. The plans are probably at about, I would say about 95% right now. There's a couple of things related to electrical um, that we need to check with Jimmy Malo just to confirm that they're, they're also in the drawings. And then as far as the project goes, we're gonna require cinema shop drawings for the pump and other components of the project to make sure that it's being done in, in conformance with the drawings. Um, the last estimate, which I, which I don't have in front of me, um, the engineer was working on, uh, I think it's under 10 grand is where his estimate was. Now he was asking, of course, the gene review it to make, you know, I mean, ultimately the city's not responsible for the money. The fact that there seems like there's enough money to build the park is, is I, I think, where everybody needs to be at. But the question did come up in the meeting if there was extra <coughs> money to be used for plantings or that sort of thing, would, we, would the city be amenable to it? And in the meeting we had said that if there was extra money to do some plantings or other landscaping around the, around the fountain, that we would just request that a planting plan or at least a meeting be held with, with Rich, Parcelli, the highway super, so that we could, we could see what was going to be done before it gets done. So pretty reasonable thing. So um, some of those things we probably would add as notes in the drawings um, for the final approval by staff. But um, we're happy where they are, and we think if the project can start moving ahead, it would be good. Why do the pumps keep or the fountains keep dying. It feels like we come back to the fountains every five years or so. Um, and, and for three of the previous five, they haven't worked. I can't speak to that. This one here has been, I mean, this has got a longer history than me. Well, Rich can speak to it. I mean, he, he's kept some, some fountains operational. So the, uh, I, I the, think he's. The, the fountain that's in uh, Trinity Road Park was is the original fountain that was similar to the one that used to be in the center of Florence where Co or, uh, Kojolinski Park is and also where Sojourner Truth Park is. They were just basically black topped uh, circles that had stone, you know, stone stones built in with mortar and they just were running on city water all the time. Um, and so the one that was in the Trinity, uh, the one that's in Trinity Road Park is the last of its kind and um, I think Ed Button, who was the highway super before me when he was a foreman, tried to actually put a new blacktop base in that one and tried to get it to run, but unfortunately there was no water source there because um, the water service has been cut off at this point. So, so some of them just ran city water yeah, and, could, and yep. ran down the drain? Just ran down the drain into, okay. the, into the sanitary sewer and that was it and there was no meter on it and it wasn't recorded. And sure. So there's been a lot of efforts to, to get this uh, Trinity Row fountain up and running by a different outside entities, but this is the first time there's been a great collaboration, I think, between our department and the citizens of Florence and people that have donated to get this thing to happen. So um, I think the plan that we looked at was excellent. It mirrors the one that's similar in design uh, to uh, you know, the way that one of the system runs in the center of Florence right now, but it's a brand new design. The, the one in the center of Florence, we, we retrofitted it to make it work. So. But I, I think it's going to work great, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you, Rob. So, um, Rich, what happens to the water on this? Um, it, it just continually recirculates, and so oh, it, the, the, the staff the staff has to go there uh, roughly every day and clean the fountain out, top it off because of uh, just to make sure because of evaporation, because right. of leaves and everything. Yeah. And we, we, we put chlorine in them. Yeah, but and it's not going into our sanitary system. No. No, and then we pump them out at the end of the year, yeah. and then we put them our uh, marine injuries to winterize them, and they're good till the next year. Cool. So. And I, 
Actually, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. So, this is on public property, so the fountain, once it's reconstructed, will be a public fountain. Mm -hmm. so, and, and then we'll maintain it going forward, it sounds like. Yeah. Are there any, is the DPW providing any assistance with the construction other than, I guess I heard about the water, we're running water a, service yep, extension? Yeah, we're running a water service line up to the fountain. Um, we started to, to do that um, when we just we put a tap in earlier this year, but we're going to run the water line up to the fountain. And the other thing is that we're doing is providing some construction oversight <coughs> inspections of the fountain when, it's, when it's being built. So um, we just have another set of eyes on what's going to be left on city property. Okay, good. Thank you. Any other discussion on the board? Uh, yes. Fountain at the other end of Main Street um, in front of the Civic Center is that? That triangle, that has to be city property. I know that this former councilor gave money to restore that. Yep. And so that's really similar. It, it is that that is similar. Yeah. Um, but the bowl, the difference is that the bowl that is on the one in the center of Florence was the using the existing bowl, which is retrofitted, which built a new uh, a new tower in the center of it. But it operates the same way. It operates the same way. as a recirculating pump. Uh, it has a, a standpipe next to it, a small standpipe that that we go has a little bit on it and we go and we top it off as, as we need to. So it's probably the best way to it's the best way to do it and it's actually if you stay on top of them every day maintenance wise they they, they will go right from Memorial Day right until they do yeah. so I don't think it's nice. I I, <coughs> I just think it, it would be good to have some sort of standard. I, I know you just talked about pumps and what we have there and how different is this pump. I mean it may not really matter much. We use the same pump. We're trying to use the same pump. Okay. Would be the idea, so that right, readily available for parts and all that. Yeah. And my last question is really about liability. Does the city have a liability? Does, does the department have liability over um, someone falling in and drowning? Does that just fall under city? The city does have insurance. Right. right. <coughs> there are a lot of places in the city that could happen. Of course. Um, but I, you know, it's not going to do some of our problems. Actually, they'll be frozen solid tomorrow. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's, another, that's another agenda <laughs> item. That's not a bit, man. <laughs> All right, any Just um, an observation. Does the board feel like we could take a vote on this? So we have a I'm motion right. to give the go ahead to move forward. Second. Well, I, mean, I think we've already mm -hmm. gotten past that. Oh. So, all, so a yes vote is uh, giving permission to move forward with this project. All in favor of moving ahead. Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay. Great. Thank the, you. Uh, the fountain head company in Greenfield is the one that supplies the fountain heads. I actually had a dozen of them that I tried on the Kalajinski Park. And they're different pitches that are cut into a s screw like a spiral. And it breaks the water particles up and spreads them out more or less and so when we figured out the one that worked on this one I had one that was smaller and that went to the Spring Grove Cemetery uh, fountain also and the other fountain was built by the city forces uh, Rich and Billy Sullivan um, and did, it was a fantastic job I mean it's really it's, it's a great addition to Florence and this one is about time this one goes to well it sounds like it's going to we also have an email from uh, that addressed all liabilities and things such as that from uh, Joe Cook Well, work with Nick to get the updated plans and everything over to you. Yep. Um, he's making some minor revisions to them for the electrical and that sort of thing, and we'll get you the final set. Okay. Right. Yep. And on the plan, it says remove and reuse the bushes, and the bushes are really junky, and I can't find any historical significance to the bushes that are around there. Yeah, we're changing that. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, when was the last time this fountain operated? Okay. I was in high school, no, so no. early 70s. It was 10 years ago. 10 years ago? We, we, you we were in high school ten years ago. Did it operate? Yeah, we got to run it a couple times because the community band used to uh, perform on that park. And actually, we were lucky enough to have it run a couple of times, but the basin got so far. So, it, so it ran a couple of times ten years ago, but you remember it as Ed <coughs> Buttons. No, Ed Buttons got it run it, I think two or three times in the last uh, I don't know decades. But the last time it actually ran all the time was uh, I was in high school because we used to stop there uh, on our way back to high school, and that was about. And then, like 1972 or something, it was it was continuously running, and it leaked so much. Ed Buttons finally put pavement on top of broken concrete. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, I one, just have to. Uh, one I have more this, 
you go ahead. When do we expect it to be done? It'll be done in this construction season. It'll be done. Yep. So October? No, before Labor Day. <laughs> Just Maybe by 4th of July, if everything goes well. <laughs> That's pushing it, though. I've got one uh, little hey, story. Winter hasn't ended yet. Okay. I got one little story. Just I, <clears throat> it was too interesting not to tell it. Uh, in Rome, all the fountains were driven from the aqueducts, mm -hmm. like when they would just run city water and then down the drain. And I was down in Ecuador, and there was a sp an old Spanish villa with a fountain in the courtyard. And I there was no way there were aqueducts. And I asked what they did. Servants would run up and down the stairs with buckets. So if there was a party and they wanted the fountain going, <laughs> servants would be running up and down the back steps with buckets. <laughs> sort of like the water department. <laughs> <laughs> when the reservoir gets <laughs> low, you department. fill the buckets here and you drive them up to the street. All right, so now I think uh, Cosmian Park is our next. Yeah. Great. So I'm looking for uh, approval to take new business number one out of order. So move. Second. <laughs> You're right. Actually, let's, let's go move right to that. All right. So, um, do you want to? Why don't you present your? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Donna Bell Cassis again. Um, I'm an artist in Florence, and I'm putting together an event called Florence Night Out, which is an event to highlight um, the creative, dynamic, vibrant community of Florence through the arts, and um, I'll be having live music, dance performances, um, artist receptions, and open studios during the evening from 5 to 8. And what I'm proposing for the <coughs> Trinity Row Park um, is having two dance performances. One would be, um, since it is on May Day, which is May 1st, um, a Maypole dance by the Morris, the Marlboro Morris men troupe, dance troupe, and they would actually install a maypole in the center of the park. Um, they would teach and lead a maypole dance with the community members who would like to be involved and do other Mars dances. Um, that would be from 5 to 6 p.m. And then uh, there'll be an hour in between that for the other troupe to set up, which would be the Oroco Nuevo Afro-Cuban Dance Group, and they will be performing from 6 to 7 in the evening. It might be 6.30 <coughs> to 7.30. One of the members has to come from Brattleboro, so it's sort of tentative, but they do have to set up a tent and um, set up their stage. There is one question about electricity, if they're able to attach their PA system for the singers um, at the park as well. But that, those are the two events that I will be proposing to plan for that, um, that area. Electricity? There is power there, right. and it can be used. Is it okay for them to, uh, the Morris group, to dig a hole, keep the sod, to put the maypole in? It's about two feet deep, ten inches wide. They keep the sod and then they place it after the That would be okay. We'd want to know the location to make sure it was safe to it's dig there. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have to ask them that, too. I'm not sure exactly where they would put it. But, um, but it would look, they would like to actually set it up around three or four o'clock because it takes a while to set it up and it would be okay to just stay there until the performance starts in line. It, it should be, it should be a pretty <laughs> Yeah, Just want to know, I guess, what this is Yeah. Just a point of information, I'm just curious as to, there's two different park listings on this. Cosmian Park and Trinity Royal Triangle are two different things, two different locations. So which Someone told me it was Cosmian Park. I referred to it as the Trinity Road Park, which you're, you're is you're the one right there. Park. Okay, it's Trinity Road Park. So the, the one by Trinity Road, not the one in front of the Civic Center. No, no, correct? no, not the Civic Center. Okay. The other side. Because there's lots, because there is lots of underground power mm -hmm. in that park. Mm -hmm. so okay. Who would I? Oh, okay. you have to get it approved first before I ask mm -hmm. any other questions. Any questions on the board? Yes? No? Well, I, yes. I know that we um, we are often asked to approve the use of Pulaski Park, and I wonder if there's the same process that we have for these parks. We haven't had a process for, that I can recall, for any other park but Pulaski Park. <clears throat> and we had parade events that start at Lambrun and run downtown. Um, mm -hmm. I believe this is the second time this is happening in Florence. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've had some events in South Trinity Road Park, but we never had a 
full-fledged permitting process, I think we can classify. But if we did, does this application yeah, tick fitting. all the boxes? It would be fitting. Well, the, 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 I, I the boxes are ticked is that liability insurance, payment for electricity, anyone's concurrence, which would be the board's concurrence, because you have the academy concurrence there. I can only speak from experience, back to the old timer thing again. <laughs> um, the, the community band actually has used this park in the past, and we never had to do anything as formal as this. We used that. We used to have to get a permit that somehow got carried between the police department and the, and the DPW. And it was always one of those things that was supposed to happen all by itself, but it never did. And then we got to go down to the police department and basically hand carry the permit back up to uh, to uh, work. So just basically to know. I think it was mostly just to yeah. make everybody know that something was happening in the park. Now that Florence is becoming so vibrant, <laughs> maybe <laughs> we should expand the policy. We can do that, sure. You can also look at Lampton Park where it's that gets frequently used to. So any further discussion before we go? Well, oh, yes, Gary. One question, just curious if, if the fountain restoration would uh, interfere with your May date, and what is the, what's going on in September? Oh, wait, uh, 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 well, nothing at the park is planned for September. Oh. There's tomorrow's mm -hmm. night out will hopefully happen right here. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, Thursday, September 18th is just Lawrence night out, but not necessarily to occupy Trinity Road. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Road Triangle. So we're only really approving Trinity Road Triangle use for May 1st. May 1st. So a yes vote approves raising a maypole and having a maypole dance on May 1st. Before we vote? <coughs> yes. So I, I do think we ought to be consistent with how we treat people using various parks in the city. So are we talking about imposing that change for this use? So, and, and it sounds like what we normally look for is insurance and, and, and payment for electricity. But we, we have we have that. Permits. You said that they ticked all the yeah, boxes. Yeah. All right. We don't issue any permits for Florence. I, Correct, but if this were Pulaski Park, they've got the insurance, they're willing to pay for the electricity. As I said, if they ticked all the boxes, if we did use the same standards. No, we have no boxes. Yes. No, well, we would use the same standards, I would assume, Put park if the board wanted to do that going forward. But it, what I asked you was, if we were using the same standards, have they picked all of the boxes? No, the boxes. I thought you had said there are no boxes. I understand that. Okay, we're talking a hypothetical box. Right. <laughs> okay. Do they have no insurance? Not that I'm aware of. No. And is one of those boxes just to clarify food issues as well? I know it is for Pulaski. It's park. not allowed in Pulaski. Park. Right, right. right. So you'd have to develop a policy for this park if you want to know food in this park also. So mm. what I'm hearing you say is that we can approve this, but then going forward we would establish similar um, rules for other park uses in town, or we can not do this because it doesn't have a policy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I, well, I was right. asking if there, if there was a similar policy, and I guess the answer is no, but that doesn't change the situation in my, well, my, my view is that <clears throat> I don't remember anyone coming to the board to ask to use Trinity Road Park, and so uh, with a new fountain going in, I can see that happening more, mm -hmm. and I think that for tonight's purpose, I don't see why we can't grant permission to do it, but <coughs> as I think about the future, I think it would make sense to think about, well, what if somebody wanted to use some other park, and we have this, we have this piece in place that <coughs> this sort of permitting process with various issues that have to be resolved before we grant a permit to use that park. It would be, it would seem to me, it would be relatively simple to kind of roll that into all parks. But since there is no policy at this park right now, I don't, it seems like, I wouldn't want to rush it. I'd rather take our approve this and rush it. That's I mean, and then look at <coughs> policy. 
two. I would suggest possible consideration of approval of the use pending staff review of uh, insurance requirements for the procurement officer to make sure that the liability issues are taken care of. The rest of the things I, I think are relatively incidental in terms of power use and what they're doing seems fairly non-intrusive. And then we can work on the policy to see this park is obviously a little different than the Pulaski Park and then craft a slightly right. different policy with different requirements. But right. for the purposes of moving it forward, I think it might be reasonable. Sure. So I think, do we have a motion? Well, I, I, I want to second what, what Jim just said as, as far as liability on this particular, but I also, I agree with Gary, I think moving forward, um, we ought to adopt mm -hmm. at our leisure a, a uniform policy that applies to all, all Northampton's public spaces. So do we have a motion on the floor? I don't think What do so. we need? We need a motion of granting <coughs> approval uh, pending the staff's review of the insurance issue. So moved. Second. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Any other comments, Mike? No, that's good. Yeah? All right. All in favor of granting the approval? Aye. 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 Great. So you'll work with Jim to figure out the uh, liability insurance issue in case the coal falls. Oh, right. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next up, snow plowing and potholes. Um, Ned has invited Rich Parsonletti, the highway superintendent, to come and talk to us. Um, Rich and I also spoke and I, I had said to him that I thought the uh, Board might be interested in hearing about the challenges he faces in both areas, um, and if he sees any opportunities that we could help with uh, more equipment. I mean, obviously not ten more people. You can't do that. But if there are any opportunities, and you mentioned a couple, for example, with the uh, stormwater, you're going to get a couple more stormwater people. There might be more people who could drive the big equipment. Thank you. Um, I just, if you give me just a few minutes, I want to give you a quick overview and talk about snow and ice first. <coughs> sure. After. Um, I wanted to talk about just give a little overview of this winter, uh, just from my records and my notes that I've kept. Um, <coughs> so for snow fighting this year, um, we've had a total snowfall of 50 and a half inches in Northampton, and that includes every storm event we've had, which, uh, with the exception of the ice events, they're kind of hard to measure, but uh, any kind of measurable snowfall. It ended up being 50 and a half. Um, so that, out of that 50 and a half, 32 of those were storm events. That's what caused all this. So 32 storm events altogether. So a storm event would uh, include a, a sanding operation. Um, it would include in plowing operations. Uh, and then out of those 32 events, we had six plowing events where we actually plowed uh, the city streets. Um, and uh, we also had uh, Nighttime snow removal. Uh, we did nighttime snow removal from 11 to 7 downtown four times um, <clears throat> at, a at a rough cost of about $30,000 altogether to do that snow removal. Um, the uh, I'm sorry, what was that, Rich? I, mi I missed the dollar figure. It was about 30, 30, about 30000 Okay. It's, a, it's about $7,000. It could be a little more because I haven't calculated everyone's salaries, but it's roughly about 25 people. To, to run that operation. Um, we also, uh, this year, we uh, purchased about 3,081 tons of salt through our salt contract, which you approved. We had a salt contract of 4,000 for a total purchase of $227,716. The amount of salt we used this year was uh, roughly 2,700 tons at a total cost of the city of $199,530. Um, so for total, this I got this from Anne Marie Shower, our, our financial administrator today. Um, not not including the last week's this payroll that I believe is going to be entered tomorrow uh, because it's, it's payday tomorrow. Um, total for the whole year for this year, we spent seven hundred four thousand six hundred ninety four dollars and six cents on snow removal. So just a little under three quarters of a million dollars, which it's pretty close to the winter of. 2011, two, no, 2012, 2013? Three years. Yeah. No, it's three years ago. You're right. It was my first year that I was superintendent. We had 75 inches of snow in two months, which was um, totally obscene, and we had the same complaints we have today, uh, or this year. So one of, one of the things that I, I wanted to touch, touch base on was uh, the fact is that 
you and I had a conversation about contractors today, so I did, I did a little. Um, I did a little research. We've spent this year alone fifty-five thousand three hundred eleven dollars and eighty-seven cents on contractors. Those are the outside contractors we have. We have forty-eight plow routes, um, and there are four contractors mm -hmm. that occupy seven routes. So there are seven routes that those gentlemen. They have uh, outside vehicles that come and plow with us and assist us. So the rest of the route drivers are city employees. So it takes about 54 municipal employees to run this new operation. That includes myself. It includes uh, the office staff. Um, we have a clerk who runs around the clock here uh, when we're doing snow removal and snow operations in the middle of the night. And three mechanics and the rest are drivers and operators. So it's quite a big operation. And one of the things I saw an editorial in the paper about mm -hmm. having more outside contractors, we advertised the snow plowing contract, and <coughs> those were the only ones that we had bids on. So we hired every single person that bid, and hmm. yeah, that was it. Yeah. Did, did, did they bid on particular routes? They wanted specific routes, or no, just only four they people just came bid, forward? Just four people came forward, and yeah. one guy has three trucks this yeah. year, I think. And they were the only ones that came that's forth. That's typically how it. That's typically how it's been. They're the same contractors we've had year after year, but it is advertised, um, and they are paid the same rate as the, uh, the state. state. So there really is no variance. It's just I think that um, the state's policy in snow and ice removal is a little different than ours. The state actually, when they hire a contractor, they hire a contractor with a vehicle, a large vehicle like a ten wheeler or a six wheeler that has a, a sander capability. And so there's actually more money to be made for a contractor working for the state because the state can't solve all its uh, highways and mm -hmm. uh, arteries uh, by itself. So it's seventy-five ninety an hour yeah. plus fuel adjustment and pay that fuel. And so these these contractors work hand in hand with our own employees, with the exception that we don't have any contractors when we're doing snow removal operations, which is picking snow. We don't have any contractors. We we do that all ourselves with our own employees. So the way that I categorize snow operations is there's snow fighting. Snow fighting is, this is from Peter McNulty, so I'm digging way back. Snow fighting is the overall operations. And then we have snow, we have salting operations, snow plowing, and snow removal. And so we basically handle all those operations in-house with the exception of the seven contractors. So th this year has been, this year was really, in my opinion, a or a ch more of a challenge. It was a challenging year, but people say it was a bad winter. I don't really look at it as a bad winter. We actually had 50 inches of snow. To me, it's not a lot. I, I worked here when there was 116 inches of snow, and that was a lot um, this year. And it came in very small amounts. So in the months of December and uh, early January, we had you know small storms. We had one large storm uh, before Christmas, and then we had another large one afterwards. It was a plowing event, but the rest of them were small until we got into the middle of January, we got a 10 inch storm and then we got our 12 inch storm, which was on the 13th and 14th of February, which was Valentine's Day. So I think we actually handled the winter very well until we got to right about um, the beginning of February in that time period right there, because there were a lot of forecasts, forecasts that I rely upon. Um, and we ended up having these, the, the uh, 12th and the storm on the 12th and uh, sorry, the 13th and the 14th. And we had had a storm prior to that, so there was a lot of snow downtown. So we had we were able to pick snow um, on. Hold on let me keep it right here. Let me the, date. Uh, the 12th, the 12th of uh, February is when we, that we picked snow, and then we had the huge storm, and then there was multiple storms predicted between that time and the next time we got out to downtown was the 25th of February to pick. So Pleasant and King Street in that area, and that's where Mr. Blumenthal and a few other business owners were uh, not very pleased with our performance. Um, we, had, we were not able to get to his store, so he had basically two or three storms stored in front of those. Mm -hmm. But King Street and Pleasant Street also are, King Street in particular is a lot wider, so it can hold the, hold the snow a lot more than the other streets can. So we didn't get, we weren't able to go back out and finish that until the 25th of uh, February. And two reasons, one is, um, during, the, uh, during operations, when we're in plowing operations, we are not in snow removal operations. For us to be in plowing operations, every truck that we have has a plow on it. And we have to have, uh, and all the loaders and the grader itself all have plow routes. So those are the pieces of equipment that we use to pick snow. So in order to stop operations and flip over and go ahead and pick snow, we have to take all the snow plows off. All the sideboards have to go on the trucks. 
the blower has to go on the blow on the loader, uh, the grader has to come off its power route. So trying to shift gears uh, in the middle of a storm to go pick snow right after the storm is virtually impossible. And then there's the human factor, right. which is sleep. So on the, th the uh, 13th and 14th, I was awake for 36 hours. And that was just about everybody that worked here, uh, even the uh, um, Debbie in the office was up because Debbie worked all through the night with us and then Mary. And that was also around the time when we had a, a few days off. Uh, City Hall was closed. So it was it was kind of crazy. Um, so in, in a typical snow operation, what really, and I want to back up a little, what happens is that I receive weather forecasts from multiple weather sources. We have a, a fax machine that we rely upon here. Um, weather services, which comes out of the eastern part of the state, National Weather Service, local stations, and then I, and then I use a gentleman who uh, forecasts out of Virginia who's really very accurate and I like him. He's a, a trader, a day trader, forecaster. So so I watch the radar, I watch the forecast, I try to pay attention to what's going on, and then if I can anticipate a storm's coming, then we put people in place to be here for a salting operation. So the first thing that happens is we salt all the mains uh, while it's actually starting to snow. Um, if it's an event is forecasted to be less than an inch, we treat it with salt. If it's an event forecasted to be over an inch, we will plow. So then that um, kicks in another operation where we start to have to bring all these people back in that the salt and put all the plows back on the vehicles. The employees get called in. Yes, sir. Not to interrupt you, did you also have a warm weather <coughs> operational issue downtown with taking this out? Yeah, I, I will, I'll get to that, okay. after, but I was just trying to give an overview of how we, just operationally, if you're interested, how we do things. So we start plowing operations and we plow until the storm is over. Uh, so if, for example, this event that we had that was on the 13th and 14th, we were here at 7 in the morning on uh, Thursday. None of us went home until about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, the following day and we worked all through the night, two shifts plus two day shifts. So what happens is that once the city is completely plowed out, obviously the snow emergency is put on in the very beginning of the storm. And then we end up keeping the snow emergency energy for two nights, which is throughout the whole city. So this the second night after the storm, we have the ability to go downtown and we do our cleanup, which is basically take all the snow because downtown's rules are a little different. The snow emergency down there is about from the hours of 12 to seven. So during the daytime, uh, people, uh, residents and people that are coming to our community can park wherever they want. So we can't really do snow removal very effectively. So we have to come back on another night shift to actually pull the snow away from the curb on Main Street and put it in the middle. And plus clean up all the other streets, all the other side streets. So usually after that, so we, we have one night of snow plowing one night of snow removal, and then the third night is the night of rest. Everyone sleeps, except for a small skeleton crew. We have a night shift that works here. Uh, we have 11, 3 to 11, 11 to 7 in our day shift. So usually on the fourth night, providing there's no weather events, no broken equipment, uh, everyone lived, we will go start to pick snow. But this year, we've had incidences where, you know, I'm basing everything on forecasts where we weren't able to actually do that. So we had a long stretch between the uh, 12th and the 25th where we weren't able to actually go and pick snow because they forecasted two different storms. One was 48 inches, which was for that Saturday afternoon Sunday of that time frame, which we got an inch and a half. And then there was one during the, um, another one forecasted for Monday. And then so that Wednesday of the 19th, which was the night we were gonna pick snow, they had that freak three inch snowstorm that came out of nowhere. And that just kind of, really made things very difficult. So we had to swap gears, put all the plows back on, and go plowing. I was actually the only storm this year I wasn't able to put any chemicals out first because it came so fast. So, and then, you know, once we're successful at picking snow after the fourth, fifth night, sometimes we'll have to go two or three times to pick downtown. It depends on the volume of snow. And that's where we, I think we get ourselves operationing a little bit of trouble because we don't have um, enough, we don't have two graders and Terry and I talked about this on the phone today about the fact that it would be beneficial if we possibly looked into investing into another used grader for the department. We have two snow blowers and we have definitely enough vehicles to haul the snow away. Unfortunately, we're just hauling off to King Street, the old uh, Honda dealership. Um, so that is one thing that I think would actually enhance our operation because we could use the two blowers. I think. Uh, probably would be beneficial for us to actually look at capital improvements and maybe invest in a brand new snowblower and have two snowblowers that would run with two different operations and have a backup blower. Because typically what happened at 
two in the morning when a blower goes down, the other blower that we have is kept in reserve so we can continue the operation. So we just, you know, we don't have, we have people here working and they're getting paid and um, you can't really send them home. It's, you know, so we try to pick with buckets, which is, bucket loaders, which is very time consuming and it's not as efficient. Um, that snow blower blows, I think, about 500 tons, 500 tons of snow in a, <coughs> can blow a lot of snow. So, you know, those are, that's kind of a rough overview of how we run snow and ice operations. And then, you know, of course, after days days after the storm, we're out cleaning uh, uh, li uh, sign, uh, uh, line of sight issues in a lot of different places for residents. We're taking a lot of phone calls. We're doing mop-up operations. We're sanding, um, drift plowing. This year we had a lot, of, the weather was so cold this year, we've had a lot of uh, snow that just kind of stuck to the side streets. I mean, any street that wasn't treated, and you know, cars beat the traffic down and it just bonded to the pavement, or beat the snow down and it just bonded to the pavement and made it really hard. So we spent a lot of chemicals, we used a lot of chemicals this year. More so than more so than years in the past, but I think our switch to using all salt has been pretty beneficial for the department as a whole. And I think it gives it provides better service for the residents. Instead of that schmoo? Uh, no, the the salt actually has ice be gone too in it, which is a, sh a version okay. of the schmoo. Um, we didn't have a, a schmoo contract this year um, because our schmoo truck is not operational at this point, but <coughs> we're hoping to get that truck back and running and, and start doing that next year. That was my goal to get it done this year, but there's just too many other things to get done. It just got put on the back burner. Um, so, anybody have any questions? Ned brought up a point that you were going to cover about warm weather removal. Oh, yeah. So what happens is that uh, when the weather gets to be about when it's this time of year when it's obviously the sun is much warmer even though the thermometer is going to say 30 degrees out the angle of the sun is much stronger uh, when we pick snow with the blower in this kind of weather the blower has a tendency to plug up constantly so you will go 20 feet and the blower is clogged operation has to stop operator gets out he has to shovel goes another 20 feet gets plugged so it's operationally kind of challenging at this uh, this time and then when the temperature gets around 40 degrees you can forget about it it's not going to happen and that's actually what happened also during that week of the between the 12th and the 25th we had three days three or four days of temperatures in the 40s one day was in the 50s and so there was no way that we, even at nighttime it wasn't cold enough it's really got to be at nighttime 20 degrees or less it's perfect you can blow a lot of snow you know it's uh, it's, um, so I, I, it's like, I've been doing this I've been in this operation for so long that it's I hope I'm coming across as making everyone understand what's going on but it's, it's like brushing my teeth kind of sort of yeah. but anybody else have any questions yes it feels like we're we always talk about the unusual parking downtown and and how complex how that makes it much more complicated to do the plow pa the parking when I first when I first started here uh, the parking ban there was a parking ban that lasted from I think it was November 15th to April 1st so uh, we, we only were allowed to tow vehicles so I was thinking about this because I think that uh, Jim and I were talking about this uh, we were still only allowed to tow vehicles when there was an actual declared snow emergency but we were allowed to tow vehicles during that whole time of that snow emergency so when it extended during the day past 6 a.m. in the morning we could still tow vehicles off streets and that got changed, I think, in 93 or 94 to the ordinance we have presently because there were people that were visiting downtown uh, merchants and their cars were being towed away as the people were shopping, which, you know, didn't, it, it didn't, it didn't really work. So, you know, thus we, we've always gone back and done another cleanup of downtown. Um, and that's the reason why is because of the parked car issue. Mm -hmm. And it ends up happening that before we have the ordinance we have presently, the police department was very reluctant to tow vehicles during the daytime. Even though we had declared a snow emergency and it was by ordinance legal, um, they kind of chose not to. So we have the same problem with snow removal during the daytime. We have to post the streets 24 hours ahead of time because there is no ordinance that governs the daylight hours. So 7, 7 to 11, there's no ordinance that says we can actually physically tow cars. It has to be posted 24 hours, a day, like for 24 hours prior to the day we want to pick. And we have to write down all the license plate numbers of the vehicles that are there. Those vehicles cannot be towed, but anyone who parks there after that during that 24-hour period can be towed. So it's it is it is it is a little it is a little frustrating, but I most people are you know the people that 
really want their streets clean are pretty good. They'll come out and move their cars. It's a lot of the people that uh, are students that you know will park their car in the same spot for forever. I mean, Smith College actually does an excellent job of notifying all the students that there's a storm emergency, and, and very few more less cars get towed at Smith than I than they used to be. It used to be the other way around because this all on Elm Street used to tow all the cars away in the middle of the night. It's actually other places where people have residences, you know, like off of Market Street, off of Pauley Street, even off of Elm Street on the small side streets where there's residence, there's not too many, there's not any college housing. So it does present a challenge, but we have figured, a, figured out a way to work around it. I tell the operators, just be patient, don't hit anything, please. You know, just wait for the police to show up. And, uh, you know, the police are very, they're very uh, helpful in, in locating, trying to locate the uh, owners, you know, knock on doors during the daytime, but it's kind of, it can be very frustrating, but if it's posted long enough, it's okay. Do you have a quick question? I, mean, I probably had the uh, snow removal brigade driving by my house uh, this year, going toward Maine's field, and looking out the window, you see some trucks that aren't very big. You wonder how much snow was that truck actually carrying? And I was wondering if anybody ever looked into the possibility of either leasing or buying something like one of those goulet ball callers that can carry, you know, a huge amount of snow with one driver. Mm -hmm. And we've got maybe eight trucks and eight drivers carrying as much snow as one of those big jobs can carry. Um, we have uh, in our fleet right now, we just we just purchased and just took delivery on a new 10-wheel uh, dump truck. So we have uh, we have three 10-wheelers, and the single-axle five-ton trucks have sideboards, so they can actually hold about 10 tons of snow. Um, uh, those are 10, 8, probably 12 to 14 cubic yards of material in there. Um, but unfortunately, I think that the only issue that I would have with buying a trailer dump is what kind of use would we get out of it right. in the off-season. Yes. Right. Um, we'd actually be better off probably to either lease one, which is a good suggestion, but then we have to lease a tractor as well. Then we have to find a driver for it because it's a Class A vehicle. Um, or um, we could actually, you know, put out a contract for someone to actually uh, drive, you know, bring their vehicle and use a state rate. I'm not. There's got to be one floating around. We haven't done it in so long. When I first came here, we had uh, La Valley's uh, trailer dumps. We had two of them because we didn't have the many vehicles as we had now. But it's, you know, the, the streets division has kind of morphed. I mean, before before Prop 2 and a half, we had 60 employees just in the streets department. So the streets <coughs> department employees plowed the whole city. There was no use of any water department employees, sewer division employees, wastewater treatment plant. Um, there was no office support. There was no office staff. It was all done by the, by the folks next door. And when Prop 2 and a half came, that changed the whole snow plowing picture. So we had to utilize all these people that are in the enterprise funds to help us out. And if they weren't here, we would really be in a lot of trouble. We can't do it. There's only about 10 people in the streets division. So when we do snow removal, we do the same thing. We, we pull from these divisions to fill, to staff all the vehicles and equipment. So at any given night, when we're doing snow removal, it could be uh, the streets division employees, water, sewer, parks and cemetery, and uh, wastewater treatment plant. Yes, sir. I think the trailer dumps would also be better because they would keep up with the blowers. If you don't have to shuffle six trucks in to keep one of the trailer dumps. <laughs> if, if there's if there's uh, ten trucks, you never the blower is never gonna the blower will never stop moving. So the, the goal is is to keep the blower moving all night long. So I used to run the blower many moons ago, and I don't remember ever sitting still unless the machine broke. So we've had enough vehicles. And we had trailer dumps, um, but it what that would do with a trailer dump, if we if were decided to look into purchasing another grader, would allow us to have two crews. So with two crews, you obviously need more vehicles to move the snow. So that would be something we would be something we could look into. What, what I had said to Rich, suggested to Rich is that if there is an opportunity like that, if we could put a dollar figure on it. And Put it before the city council. Councilors ask about this. Sure. You know, how about how about my ward? How about the back street? <coughs> we just put it to them, like fifty-eight thousand dollars per year. We could do this, and then they can decide. Um, it feel that feels to me like it's responsive. It, it's in, it'd be interesting. It'd be an interesting exercise to see if there are any opportunities that are worth at least discussing.
that's that's the sort of thing we were talking about. Yeah. I, think. I mean, I, I think that it would be. I think the the, the main issue though with buying more equipment is, is where were you going to store it? That's that's the that's another issue that we have here. We've been talking about a new facility, and every time we get a new piece of equipment, hopefully we have to trade something in so we make room. But we bought this new vehicle, this ten wheeler, and now we have to tent. We have to kick out two other five ton trucks that have to be outside to accommodate it because we just don't have the physical space. So the investment of the buying the equipment is wonderful, but it it shortens its life tremendously by staying outside. And then the, the ability to have all this equipment and then not really use it in the summertime is also detrimental because you have a lot of brake issues that happen because of the salt contamination. If the vehicles don't move and the brakes aren't used and they freeze up, so then you're required to do brake jobs, which then turns into more you know, vehicle uh, vehicle supplies, O and M money being spent on things. So it's it's so good. we don't really need the greater at any other time of the year. Extra we, we we could use well we need we use one grader now to grade all the metals roads and do all the right. construction mm -hmm. projects we have but I think that it would, <coughs> I think that it would be more beneficial for us to look into buying a used grader to support the grader that we have. The only have is a 1981 galleon and it's tired. Uh, it's got we got its money's worth out of it. But I I think buying a brand new grader would be um, it would be too costly and I don't think it the, the payoff would be so long. Be better off to, to buy a used one, I think, so we could have run two machines, um, especially in the winter time, because you can run. If we had two machines, we could run two snow crews in one night, which we'd be able to clean downtown in one time, in one shot, and maybe even in two Florence as well. Because typically we do Florence during the daytime. Any other? Yeah. Just so the board knows, I think it was five years ago the grader broke down. We ended up getting a rental unit here in the city. I believe it was about six thousand dollars a month to rent that grader. In the winter months, so you aware of that. Rich and I had talked about whether ten thousand dollars you rented for February, uh, January, February, or something. <coughs> I mean, does that make sense? That sort of. I, I think I think that approach makes sense. You know. You know, and I think that it would be. I think it would be good for us to have another. Be good for us to have another grader so we can uh, use it to plow with, but also use it. Uh, increase our storm removal operation because using the blower with the grader is they work hand in hand. Um, it's very difficult to pull snow between meters with a pickup truck. Obviously, you can all imagine it doesn't work very well. You break things and run meters over. So the grader has the ability to cuff everything in. It also cracks all the ice that melts from the freezing and thaw aspect underneath the snow that you have to get out. So I think it would be, I think it would be beneficial, and I think we probably should look into uh, capital improvements next year for asking for a new blower, which I think we have in the past, but kind of put it off to the side because we uh, don't use them a lot. Um, we, use, we need more vehicles, actually. And the reason I ask is because um, having lived in D.C. For, for 25 years, where the, where the running joke is, <coughs> D.C.'s version of snow removal is called spring. <laughs> and and it, it has to do with basically surge capacity. <coughs> and what makes sense as far as the infrastructure that you're going to maintain and pay for and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I hadn't even thought about, you know, where you store the things during the off season. Um, so it seems to me that um, on, on critical machines like a grader or something like that, if there's a if there's a rental market, that may be the way to go. We don't have to store it, you know. Um, I, I don't know how realistic that is, um, but uh, it, it, it seems to me, at least in the short term, and, and it also raises the other question, which is, as we move forward with uh, the new facility, you know, are we going to are we going to create for ourselves additional capacity for this kind of stuff, so that you don't have to put two five tons out out in the uh, out in the yard when you when you bring the ten wheeler in? Um, I, I I don't know anything about the plans for the new facility. I wasn't I wasn't part of that discussion three years ago. Um, but but it but it strikes me as something that we need to be thinking about, which is we're not talking about necessarily if we're going to do thirty million dollars worth of you know infrastructure for 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 DPW replacing our current capacity isn't going to be enough, and and we need to be we need to be sanguine about that. So that's a discussion for another day. But. Any, any other anything else on snow and ice? Oh. Well, 
right. You only had 10 minutes. I know. <laughs> I can see you're rolling your eyes over there. I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of potholes. That's all I can say. There's a lot of potholes. And we're trying to fill them as fast as we can. Um, so far, we, we've uh, just uh, we have a new uh, work order system that we've been uh, using, which is not new, but we've been using it for as bottles of ViewWorks. So we've been using ViewWorks, I think, since the beginning of January, roughly. So in the ViewWorks system, presently we had a we've had so far 136 uh, pothole uh, requests for repairs. Uh, 57 of those have been closed, and 79 are still open. But that doesn't mean that there's a lot of other potholes out there that are not being reported, which is typically. Uh, like Sylvester Road is one giant pothole, unfortunately. So we have one work order for the whole street, but we spent the whole week there. So, Rich, just yes. a point of clarification: you've done 57 potholes since January. We have there that are orders. recorded, that are recorded via work orders. There are, for example, Sylvester Road has one work order for it. Right. We spent okay. We spent the whole. Yeah. We spent four days there. Uh, to the tune of about, uh, I think, 19 ton of blacktop, which is, you know, not at this going rate, it's 125 dollars a ton. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's not, it's not cheap. So, so far this pothole season, we spent all together um, about uh, 13, about 14 thousand dollars. So, since really January, we spent about 14 thousand on blacktop. So that includes uh, buying blacktop at the plant, which is open right now in Palmer, uh, for $125 a ton, which is ridiculously expensive, but that's the winter rate. Um, and, and the other item that we had is we usually store about 100 tons of ingots, which is basically uh, blacktop berm that we make every year, and we cut it with shovels, and then we stack it in the building, and then we load it into our two hot box reclaimers that we have, and then we patch bottles that way. But we have about two loads left in that shed. So the plant kind of opened uh, at the right time. Uh, but we're, we have two crews a day that are out patching, putting out uh, about uh, 12 ton of blacktop every day. And, uh, yes, Is the blacktop stay warm enough coming from Palmer? Yeah, we actually drive down there with the hot box and we put it in, we put it in the hot box. Oh, you know, so we take, we bring three or four ton back with us. Okay, relatively small point. Yeah. You don't have a, a hotbed dump truck? No. Would it have, if we had been able to forecast more accurately, would you have put more of the ingots aside last fall? Pro probably. I mean, it can't, must be more practical to just heat up some more of the curbing. It is, it is more practical, but the problem is with the storage, is that we have, we use our old salt shed for storage, and that thing was, we share that structure with our stop block structures for the um, West Street facility and for Route 5 uh, for the flood control system, so there's only so much room. So with the angler, we typically make about 80 ton a year, and we have some leftover. This year will be the first year that I we don't, won't have any leftover. So it, it works pretty well. You just basically, you know, you go in there with a little skid steer, you pick the ingots up, and you bring them over, and you dump them in the back of the hot box, and then it's sort of like a set it and forget it type thing, and hopefully it runs all night long. Um, and uh, we go out the next morning and put out the material. So um, our blacktop contract is the bid opening is April 1st at 11 o'clock, so we will hopefully award a bid to for a more reasonable price of blacktop. And on that note, um, that's next Tuesday. We were hoping that next Tuesday afternoon, if four of you could stop by and sign it, so that we, we don't want to wait until the April 9th meeting. We want to walk the contract around. Okay. So I'll send a message to remind you if anyone can come in next Tuesday. Yeah. Just so the board also knows about three and four years ago our budget went for doing asphalt purchasing on uh, Palmer local plant from twenty five thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars a year. And it's really for potholes and for trench repairs that we do, sewer cuts, water cuts. So it's gone up you know, threefold since three or four years ago. It's just a temporary band aid though. That's about and what's happening now is you're putting patch on top of patch. If you drive over here right on uh, Woodland would run out of it. Don't I drove, do it. I, drove, I did today. <laughs> I got my car up on two wheels and follow the gas. I don't know. I, I hope you don't ride your bike over there. I'm sorry. I do. I go right down that. It's the, great. The, 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 the gas cut. The gas cut's great. Everyone's going slow, so I can just go right down they the gas cut. gas did a great yeah. job. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's thing, you know, it's, to be honest with you, it's, it's frustrating. I think it's really frustrating for some of the employees because they just go to the same place over and over and patch. So the 
residents are frustrated about their cars and the damage, but the employees are just as frustrated because these things just keep popping out. Um, hopefully, because most of the snow is gone, we have less water penetration and they'll stay, but we still have quite a bit of frost on the ground. And that's the other thing that we've had is a lot of frost teams this year. So any, any roads that were mildly uh, going to make it are, are have some serious cracks and terrible <laughs> potholes. And we're probably going to be patching potholes on probably till July. Because I, I don't think, I mean, I've been here since 1989. So the early, late 80s, beginning, we, we had a real long stretch of not doing a lot of Chapter 90 work. And things just fell apart. And we used to go and take coal patch and just dump it all over the city. And then we started to, uh, Chapter 90's money increased. We did a lot of paving. And then it's just gone, as we all know, it's kind of fallen off the radar. So this year is a particularly bad year, a very bad year, actually. So that's, you know, it's an everyday operation. So I've taken the tree crew off doing tree work and put them in the other hot box so we have two crews a day. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of the big ones. I don't know what's going to happen next year, though. Maybe next year it'll be sunny all, all winter. We might have to talk about potholes or snow removal. <laughs> so, Rich, if you take a section with bad potholes, um, he explained to me earlier that when the pavement is so cold, there's really no effective way to patch them that's going to stay. Um, but for example, sections of Route 9 up past the curb, up past the post office, mm -hmm. or, or the streets you were just talking about, Woodlawn. Woodlawn, at some point, is it worth cutting out a section? To I, I think that, that that's that's a good question. I think that uh, from they're, they're in fairly discreet areas. They are. Seems like. There are places that are shaded that have poor drainage. Uh, there are places where cars have basically moved the, moved the subsoil somehow or another through years of abuse and going around and around. I, I think that one of the things that we have done this last couple of years is we do a lot of box paving. We have a box paver that's about seven and a half feet wide that goes on front of our loader, and we actually pave we paved Drury Lane because I heard you guys were getting sick of seeing uh, Sam Prashoni in here. <laughs> so Drury Lane got paved last year to uh, we put out a, I think 190 ton with this box. So basically, it just binds the it binds the pothole roadway down together, and it lasts for about five or six years. Mm -hmm. So it's a band aid. So a lot of these places, would, that would be what I would do with that instead of doing because for us to do that kind of work, it would require a contract, which is basically a small mill overlay. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, for example, Bridge Road from Jackson Street to Francis Street is beyond mill and overlay. Mm -hmm. That's a full depth reconstruction at this mm -hmm. point. I mean, all the potholes are right through the base course. It's, and that's what happened is a lot of these places that were troublesome are now right through the base course. So we're kind of in, it's almost like a little miniature emergency mm -hmm. mode in some of these places that next year, because we won't be able to do any mill and overlay or full depth reconstruction, it's going to be twice as bad if we have uh, a very cold winter and actually a lot of frost. So the backlog of all the paving we've had is really starting to rear its head, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately. So we're just, you know, it's like instead of being proactive in a sense, we're a little more reactive at this point in the operations end of it because we're just walking around trying to fill potholes instead of actually trying to go and do some proactive work mm -hmm. to try to prevent this stuff, which using the box paper helps, but typically I can't get to that until the, after the blacktop cool is done in June or July with potholes. So we, then we do center line painting. There's a lot of operational stuff that just is all tied, and everyone's all tied together, so it takes about seven people to do the box paving operation. So you have to pull two crews together to make one box paving operation. But it does work. It's been successful in places. Yep. Um, currently, the city has about a $39 million backlog <coughs> in paving operations that need to be done. We currently see just a little over $1 million a year in Chapter 90 funds. This year in the proposed capital improvement uh, program from the mayor's office, he's recommended the city council that we expend $500,000 towards paving also this year. So we might have an additional 50% boost this year, but it's not programmed for FY16, <coughs> but in FY17 currently he's uh, programmed a million dollars towards pavement. So I'm hoping that maybe things will change with uh, uh, the transportation bond bill, they'll increase it to the 300 million that all the superintendents, highway superintendents, DPW directors have been asking for for years. But currently it's just level funded at a um, uh, million dollars that we get, or 200 million dollars a year across the Commonwealth. 
<coughs> would it make sense to, uh, if you think about, for example, the first part of Pomeroy Terrace, when you turn off of Bridge Street, mm -hmm. uh, it's, well, I don't know how it is in the winter. I, this winter, I think it's probably pretty bad. It's terrible. <coughs> would it make sense, instead of paving entire streets, to take 200 feet of that street and just fix that area that's chronically bad or any of the, I mean, does that make any sense? It can be done, but the other thing we are trying to look at, and Jim and I have been talking about this for quite a while, is looking at the utilities underneath it. And we're coming to the realization that we'll never be able to catch up with all the work that needs to be done under the street, too. And we do have to do some paving operations, but um, the Chapter 90 funds and the, the lack of city funds, it just doesn't go far enough. Kennedy Road, the one road we did this past year, was $600,000 to do one road. But it can be done. We can do discrete areas. It becomes a little more costly if contractors hop skipping around the city doing work. One of the challenges, a lot of the roadbeds fall apart because of poor drainage. And so if we're just fixing the surface, we haven't attacked the problem. And and so the repair won't last for you. Yeah, that's Pomeroy Terrace. I mean, you, you remember the, the dissertation that Fred Zimmer did for us, <coughs> nicely done by Mr. Zimmer. Yeah, very nicely done. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really good example of uh, drainage street drainage that's not really functioning well. Um, I'll just say off, off the top that I think we we feel like there's a need to kind of get creative with the money we have, and I don't know how successful we will be with that, but David, the letter in the engineering division, and Rich and I, we're going to be meeting soon about how do, we, how do we get the most street improvement done for the money that we have? I mean, we know there's not enough. We're not going to have $36 million next year to do every street, but what's really the best What's the best bang for the buck that, that we can do? And in different ways, you know, Ned's brought the whole chip sealing concept as a way to as a way to save uh, you know save the pavement to get a few more years out of it, or crack sealing it. But we're really trying to reevaluate everything that we do to see if there's a a better way to get more done. Um, you know, because the potholes, as, as Rich said, are just you know just falling and falling and falling, and the streets are just breaking <coughs> down. So what's the way to do it? And you know, as Ned just mentioned. You know, our desire to do full street reconstruction and replace some of the old water lines and some of the utilities we have, we're not going to have enough money to do those things, but maybe you have to live with an old water line, but maybe you, you improve a street drainage thing so that the street pavement will last, and then you have a, you have a, you know, a 1920 water line you have to continue to, to rely on and, and make those sorts of hard decisions. Ideally, you don't want, you know, 100-year-old water pipes, but, you know, with the money you have, you kind of have to make that decision, that and we can't. Great. And we can't let the streets. We can't say that we're not going to do a street because it is, we'd like to do that water line too. So that's the sort of thing that we're, we're trying to grapple with. Any other questions for Rich? Some towns do oil installed on their roads almost yearly. Do they have the same pothole problem? Oops. That's a good question. Oh, Hadley, Hadley does that. And I, don't, I don't hear people from Hadley complaining quite as much as the people in Northampton do. Um, I, I think oil and stone would seal all of the cracks right that poor guy walking around that wand trying to. It is, but the problem with oil and stone, though, is it's not very effective where you have uh, drainage issues. And, and so a lot of. It, the oil and stone would be excellent for places like Sylvester Road. Not at this point, it's too far gone. Uh, but places. Uh, uh, like Turkey Hill Road would be a good for an oil and stone, which we used to we used to use here. We have a stone box actually. Uh, the last oil and stone project we did, we built a parking lot at Bets Field. So I mean, it, it is uh, another cost. It's the, it's the chip seal basically is what it is. It's chip seal, but it's actually just using you know the stone aggregate instead of the rubberized chip seal. Right. Um, it's something I suppose I think we I think we could look at in the overall scheme of where we think we need to be or where we think we should try to go with the money that we have. It's a good question. I mean, it's one of those tools that you can look at. It. The, the decision to go with the rubberized chip seal was a conscious effort on our part to try to make the dollars go further. If you can if you can save some of these streets for a few years by investing less amount of money, then it makes sense to do that. So the rubberized chip seal is something that we've just started to do on evaluating other streets where we'll be able to do it coming up. But it's the, I mean, it's the right idea, I think. The rubberized chip seal has little waste to it versus oil and stone. You have a lot of stone aggregate that just doesn't make it and hold it close to the edges of the road. Uh, a lot of bicycle hazards with it. Um, I've been watching some rubberized chip seal in West Hampton for the past 
four years and it's fall as it's working well. The water can't penetrate into it. So you're not seeing the potholes form or the, the cracking form because it's not even. So it's one, one type of thing that we've been looking at and trying to figure out what candidate road we want to use on and start doing and looking at it. Could it be used for potholes? For raised chip seal? Mean on top of potholes? I want to fill a <coughs> pothole and, and think mm -hmm. that would stay along. No, because it's just a surface coating is what it is, a wearing surface. Just like oil and stone, it's a wearing surface. It isn't, it's only this thick oil and stone. It's not like two inches of bituminous. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Rick? <coughs> so we may hear more about uh, your thoughts about new approaches to the. Rich is certainly hoping to hear new approaches. <laughs> <laughs> so, from that standpoint, I hope there will be some. Mike. Well, I was going to say, I think we ought to thank Rich for his yes. really yeah. good explanations thank tonight you, and thank for all the work you and your crews have done all winter long. Thank you. I'll, I, will, I will pass it along. And please don't be shy. At any given time when there's a snow event, if you happen to be out and you want to stop by, the employees really appreciate to see the board because I think that the. Uh, you do have donuts, right? We, we have. We, actually, this year was the first year that actually we were able to prepare food for the employees. So every, every snow event we plowed. Uh, City actually provided uh, dinner, at least one meal per storm, which was nice. I did stop and anytime I was driving past, to thank, thank you. We appreciate that, and it would be good. You know, and I know that I think that uh, you know we don't you don't see a lot of uh, rank and file employees like from the board meetings, but I think it would be good to have uh, if you're ever about that you want to stop and say hello. Then we there be warmly welcome. I think it would be a, a welcome surprise. So um, it's always good to have a little bit of connection as to what. Mm -hmm. what Obviously, not in operations, but it would be nice to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Rich. I think we had talked about at some point doing some sort of a little bit of uh, media or story about the potholes and the following operations. And can we talk about doing something a little bit more along that line? Because I think that this is the time. I mean, the season happens every year, and you know, we have the flurry of complaints that we endure. But I think that, you know, the, this whole, um, the, the thaw and melt system that, that with the potholes and, I mean, people are surprised when I tell them we have two, crew, two crews out full time filling potholes and they're like, where? <laughs> it's the, it's, they spring up so quickly that, that it, well, the it truck would be like the it would be nice to get a reporter to do sort of a background story on really the operations that you just <coughs> The trick would be to get someone like Chad Kane to be interested in the story. Yeah. Sometimes they're, they're less interested sometimes than you might think in those mm -hmm. riveting <laughs> stories like that. I'd have to say I agree with Terry because General Forty chased me around for a day and a half wants to know what we're going to do with a block on Main Street that fell out of the wall. <coughs> they were more worried about the block that fell out on Main Street than they were about the pot bottle or anything else. She said, can you do an on-camera interview? I said, no, I'm leaving. I said, I can't right now. She said, will you be back for the on-camera? I said, I can talk to you over the phone about this issue. It's not, you know, so I... Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it's uh, kind of whatever is uh, grabbing a headline. I guess potholes are old news in Northampton. Well, was that caused by the fog? Yes, it cycle? was. See, yeah. I would have been yeah. a pothole yeah. story. Yeah, it would have been a good, it's a sidewalk <laughs> pothole that created a problem, so. Good segue. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But I think it's a good point because one of the things that I never really thought about until joining the board is that there is this human cost to it. You know, people got to sleep, and 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 y y if you've been out it for 36 hours, <laughs> you're not going to be out there. You're not going to be out there picking snow, and and we sh and we have to have reasonable expectations about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I I think people are just not aware of that human cost. You know, so I I think it's a great story. I just figure out how we're going to do it. <laughs> And it, it, it sounds like if we had more people who bid on doing contract agreements that would be, I mean, you welcome that. Yes. So. Yep. We would welcome that. We have some vacant routes right now that are not filled because of, uh, you know, uh, employees, of, some employees on workers' compensation positions are vacant, so mm -hmm. it would be beneficial. Hmm. And we do try to explain to residents when they call that we really don't have a second and third shift. Right. It's the same guys that are working yeah. if the snow falls at night or in the middle of the night. These guys just have to stay and then they have to stay during the day. 
I, I think many people think that there's, you know, a full shift on every, you know, for every shift, a full oh, I don't crew think of guys. I, I don't think their thinking even gets that far. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think there's an automatic assumption that there will always be somebody here yeah. <coughs> to, okay. you know, make sure the, the lights go on. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Uh, next, we've got a contract for flow meter in the Kleinfelder in the amount of $38,000 from a sewer at the restaurant. $38,300. Exactly. Move approval. Second. Yep. BJ, you want to take this one? No, Jim does. <laughs> I don't want to do this work now. <laughs> I'm recommending tabling for an indefinite period of time. <laughs> okay. Love it. I'm gonna say five minutes. There you go. <laughs> I would explain why, but it, it would be irrelevant. I'll be back in the, I'll be back in about eight months probably explaining it again. So <coughs> Okay. Moving on. Subcommittee appointments for two thousand fourteen. <laughs> All right. Um, Chris, I think you're on the tree committee. I am. Are you the president of the tree committee? I am the chair. The chair. Mm -hmm. uh, how's that going? Chris's roots are in Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the tree committee, I, I, I'm more than happy to stay on the tree committee. The tree committee um, is in the process under the direction of, of the mayor and, and Rich and some other great minds of probably redefining its role. Um, the there are some jurisdictional issues as to you know how the law works that 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 I have still not gotten my mind around and my 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 vision is that over the next six months or so we're going to redefine what the tree committee does and it will become more of an advocacy organization rather than an um, a, implementation organization because it just doesn't it doesn't it, it doesn't seem to function well in that regard um, and there's very little interest in in uh, community interest in 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 moving it forward um, and even less money and even less money we have zero budget and then we have less than zero now that uh, the 10,000 we were supposed to get you know from the uh, from the uh, landfill mm -hmm. um, so you know it, it, it's 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 uh, I so mean, it's an exciting time. Uh, it, it's an exciting time for change. Um, and you trying to uh, sell us one of us on this position? No, 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 no. I'm, just, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm staying. I'm going to see it through. I just my, my, uh, my, my, my feeling is, however, is that uh, this may very well be a committee whose whose days are numbered, at least in its current con configuration. The BPW was so excited when that started because previous to that. When they wanted to cut down the shade tree, we all had to go stand around the tree. <laughs> right. Um, yes. Okay. All right. That's good. So I've, I mean, I've had people ask me, "Can I cut down this tree?" And I don't know the answer, and it becomes just troubling to me. Just huh? Just saying. Right. Right. You know <laughs> that that uh, you know um, what our enforcement mechanism is. Um, you know, we've had situations, and Ned can fill you in on this where um, public trees have been cut down by private individuals without permission, and we don't seem to have any recourse. And so it's, it's uh, on that level it's frustrating, and I think, I, think, I think the community would be best served if um, the tree committee's role in, in the community was to plant more trees and leave the rest of it to the cops. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, so, so I'm there. Okay. <laughs> claims committee. Right now it's uh, Gary, me, and Roe. Uh, does anyone aspire to be on the claims committee? I'm available in, just in general. Broad strokes. I'm not. Okay. But you're not trying to dislodge anyone from that. No. Roe, is it still working out for you? It's fine. It's fine. Okay, nice. Same. We met some fun people. Um, been able to help them through. Um, all right, so th so that's good. Transportation and parking, Gary. I think that's you. That is me. How's that going? Um, <coughs> well, it's a committee. I would say that there's a lot of people on the commission, and uh, there are a lot of people that come to talk.
talk about traffic calming. That's, that's one of the major agenda items. Uh, there are other issues to come up. Um, I, I like it. You do? Okay. I do. I'd like to stand. All right. Unless somebody else really wants to do it. You man. Okay. Uh, next we have the reuse committee. <coughs> and I hear such good things about your work. Well, it's a good committee. Getting better. Now I know, MJ, you've been pretty busy I hear. Yes, I haven't been able to participate in the reuse committee. Is your enthusiasm flagging? Or, I mean, how would you feel about David helping out with that? Or? I feel fine about David. How would David feel about that? Yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Does, is, does that work better for you? Yeah. I mean, I, I hear it, it, it's been a conflict a lot for you to get it there. Has, it has. The, the, the time that they need just have a okay. much more structured workplace than I <coughs> used to have. But you're making the big one. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And and if I had I mean if I had if I had a choice I'd stay on, I I enjoy being on the joint committee and find that one. Okay. That that would be my preference to stay. With. And that's the last one that city council <laughs> conference committee, and that's um, Mike MJ and myself. Mike. I'm happy staying there. Seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Okay. So everyone has a place. Always have two places. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right. I don't think do we. I don't think we have to vote for that, do we? I mean, is that acclamation? Uh, I think it's the role of the chairman to appoint. Uh, all right. Consider it done. <laughs> <laughs> um, next set of date for a claims committee. I don't want to be on claims. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of claims. Is that true? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't want to mind claims at all. I'm, oh, that's a wrong thing. I'm enthusiastic in the public work we do with claims. Because I think, no, I truly think that we reach out and, and make people happy with them. Oh, thanks you have a member of that committee. So, BJ, how much time will we need for these two claims? Fifteen each, and you already have a meeting. You already have a claims meeting on the ninth, the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So maybe the 23rd. Well, unless you want to squeeze these all three in, if you can. Oh, gosh. Oh. Right. 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 Because we also have Pulaski Park starting on this <coughs> the 24th of April. It's right up from the Red Barn. Right up from the Red Barn. Oh, All right, it has to be, because there are no houses. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing? No, yeah. we're not going to do yes. that? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There was another one that got canceled. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The 24th is the first year. Yeah. The 24th is the first year. So we'll do one each. One each. One on the 23rd, one in May. Oh, OK. At 5.15 yeah, on the 23rd. And then letter arrived first. May 14th. Okay. May 14th, 5.15. Okay. It's for the yeah. Mm. It's just um, west of the Red Barn at oh. Norway. Oh, okay. That's the new yeah, house? That's, new house. that's yeah. the new house? I think so. Well, the no, newly no, renovated. No, the new house. That they built like five years ago. Riverside. We're 288 Riverside. Oh. <laughs> These are all Riverside people. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah Peter, Peter <coughs> McQueen is at 290, so it's, it's got to be right there. Right there. Oh, awesome. hmm. Is it the Germans? Pop right. question. Right. Okay, <laughs> you, you kids talk later. Uh, change order number one for contract 224-14 to Kinsley Power Systems for temporary generator rental in the amount of $350 for the sewer enterprise. Mm -hmm. Second. So this was the first rental we had down at the wastewater treatment plant for doing the load tank testing. Um, and what happened, there was a, a environmental charge and a delivery charge that I did not catch. 
and that's what makes this contract full now. It's this three hundred fifty dollar payment. It's an environmental change. Servicing from an oil change, like going to your car dealership. They have to dispose of the oil. <coughs> um, any discussion or questions? All in favor of approving this change order? Aye. 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 Great. Change order number two, the contract 257-11 for the cross-connection consult consultant to water service protection, the amount of 28750 So this is the second change order. The first one you did was a misunderstanding on our part with uh, the cross-connection coordinator. The level of services he needed to work with with the consultant to transition this whole program over into a full department coordinator. We assumed that he was looking at 25% of the contract year to be done, when it was 25% of the three-year contract to be done. So this is making up that differential to continue the training of our coordinator to know where all the, the backflow prevention price, uh, the, the backflow prevention devices are in the city. And they're behind doorways and closets. They're all over the place. And uh, basically it's having Dave Sparks go around with the current person and learn how to take over this entire program in its entirety. Is this a forever thing or is no, it, this, this is, is a one time documentation? This is it. This is it done. Yeah. So so we had a person that was hired a year ago. We put him in the program, they started training, and then he left for another place of employment. And so we're kind of starting from scratch again. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, who owns water Sur service protection. Um, has offered his services for one last year. He's trying to retire himself. So this is the transition that we started over a year ago. And we had to uh, hiccup when the employee left and we're picking this all up again now. Didn't we pay him less than this to do the actual work? Mm -hmm. No. What did the current contract was spent? $50,000. Is it? 50? <coughs> okay. No, what's? 575 was On the, the top? The top yeah, one? 57 five. Okay. That's annually. Yeah. And <clears throat> at the end of this process, will it be completely documented? There'll be a binder we just hand to someone? Dave Swartz is making that binder. He's okay. documenting it all now. Mike? It seems to me that it sounds like we're, we're, we paid like 14000 in the first change order and we have 28 in the next, in this change order. So it's like $42,000. Just three quarters of a year. Sounds like a lot of money for a transition. And I, I sure don't, don't really know what's involved, but it does. Um, just sounds like a lot. Of, it, maybe it would help if we knew how many devices there are or how many locations there are that someone has to go to. But it, I, I wonder why sure. they can't be done in a couple weeks. And, and Dave Sparks is doing the work to create the binder. So we have 1,200 tests that are done annually to be compliant with the cross-connection program. A state licensed individual must do the testing. We have 789 registered cross-connections with testable backflow preventers that have to be done twice yearly or annually depending on the type of device. And they also have to survey all the commercial, industrial, and municipal buildings to locate potential health hazards going forward too. As new business come in the city, those businesses need to be inspected and determine whether or not they need to be part of the program also. Um, last year they billed out $62,000 in testing services um, through the program. It is a revolving fund for the city. And Dave believes that it was going to take between five to six months to completely learn the program from Mr. McCarthy. Those are the notes that I have. I guess I wonder what we'd do if Mr. McCarthy weren't available. We'd contact out the service again. But that person wouldn't have the benefit of the transition, right? Hmm. Tom, Tom, Mr. McCarthy's been doing this, I think, on the order of 15 years or so for yeah. the city. And, and the way it's been done, it's been a break-even proposition for the city. It was a revolving fund where it wants yeah. to cover our costs. And so we're paying him primarily to find out where these cross connections are, the 750 cross connections? 
That's correct. So he works hand in glove all day long, every day? That's what Dave's doing now, plus also... 40 transition. hours a week, he's... Plus he's working with transitioning the water superintendent, Greg Nuttallin, so he's assisting with that also at the moment. But we believe that within the next six months or so, Greg will be on his own running the, the, the division, and uh, David will be doing just cross-connection work. got to be more than just finding out what these valves are and the cross connections. Well, that's, and that's part of my hang up is that's it's what I envision. It, it's more, it's got to be more than that. I haven't read all this information that David sent. Tom McCarthy historically has done the testing of these, these cross connection control devices for us. There was a surveying component that apparently is more detailed. I don't know the details of it, but it's more than we have typically done in our program. The state found that we were delinquent in the surveying aspect of the program. It's an area that we're trying to get back up to speed on. I think Dave is relying on Tom to help with some of the surveying so that we can get the additional work done so we can, we can come back into compliance with DEP and just to do. I don't know all the specifics, but Tom has a lot of expertise. Dave has his licenses and he has and, and knowledge. He's a very smart man, but I think during the transition he's looking for help to make sure that the surveying that we've done and the testing continues to be done so that we're compliant in all these things. So there's some different components to it. Um, and I can't explain the complexities because I haven't taken the time to go through all mm -hmm. this information, but um, I do think there's a need to have Tom McCarthy on, on, on call basically to help us with these things so that we can make sure the program gets up on the right foot with Dave. But I think it's a little more intricate than, um, than just having him drive around town with Dave to find out where his devices are. I think it's a lot more than that. And Dave's had to be, he's been on FMLA, he's had some personal family issues that he's had to be out a lot, so. So actually some of the survey work's being done by McCarthy. It is, okay. because he's, been, he's had some illness in his family. And there's some timeline issues with mm -hmm. yeah. done. Yeah. But I, I guess I'm okay with it. All right, any further questions or comments? Uh, so. <clears throat> Change order number two, the, a yes vote, um, approve this change order, and adds $28,000 to the um, consultant's package. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Change order number two, the contract 282-11 for Hill and Dale traffic improvements to Fustin O'Neill in the amount of $1,500. Second. And that'd be general fund, I guess. Um, yeah. Actually, it's coming out of the revolving fund right at the moment because it's a reimbursable by the owner of the the mall is paying us for the work to be done. When they wanted to put the traffic signal in there, we told them that they had to take care of all the costs that the DPW incurred in review of plans, uh, final inspections, startup operations, and so on through a consulting engineer, Fuss O'Neill. Uh, the work is basically almost all done. We have some small issues down on Bear Street with. Um, pedestrian crossing, they're supposed to get their contractor, Dave Electric, out and do it, which means we have to go through another final uh, inspection period on this. Uh, and that's what this $1,500 is covering, is plus some of trying to do uh, the punch list items and the final inspection again, since it didn't meet muster the last time. And like I said, we're paying for it. Colvett's group is paying us back for our uh, property expenses. Okay. Any questions or comments? All in favor of approving the change order? Aye. Aye. Um, okay, next contract for zinc orthophosphate for the water department through Shannon, Shannon Chemical Corporation in the amount of 28000 for the water enterprise. This is our annual contract for zinc orthophosphate, which is part of our co corrosion control facility on Route 9. That's the only chemical that we currently put in from that facility. Last year's contract was $7.37 a gallon. This year it's Seven dollars and fourteen cents, or twenty-three cents less. Good. All in favor of this uh, approving this contract. Aye. 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 Great. Change order number three: the contract two ninety-five dash thirteen for the water main improvements <coughs> to Ted and Howard in the amount of nineteen hundred dollars. This is a, a change of a 
excuse me, change order with Kate and Howard to have them do a design plan for a uh, replacement water water line on Winslow Avenue. Um, originally, we, we had intended on doing that design in house to have it constructed as part of the Hinkley Street reconstruction project. But with Hinkley Street being delayed a year because of some stormwater design permitting things that have come up, we decided that we wanted to move on the Winslow Ave water line anyway this summer. So the idea is that if we take this water main and have Tate and Howard do the design, we can combine it with the Pine Street and Rural Bank Road work that we're doing and fit all that water line work together this summer. So this um, amendment is uh, for the preparation of a drawing for Winslow Avenue for, for a new water main. And it's $1,957. And this, this is the Hinkley Street Water Line? And is this related to fire flows? And it is. It was one of the recommendations in the Tate and Howard asset management study on the water side. Mm -hmm. So there are some things happening down in that area that wouldn't be evident um, without knowledge of the system and fire flows and how water is flowing in that area. But it's a side street, but it's an important location that was identified. Um, any questions or comments? All in favor of approving this contract or the change order? All right. All right. And then finally, change order number two to contract 239 12 for the industrial park interceptor replacement design to Kleinfelder in the amount of zero. We're just we're merely extending the contract. The design's just about done. We need an extension in order to pay a bill. Maybe, maybe two. Okay. All in favor of extending the contract? Aye. 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 Great. Um, Stormwater flood control update. Anything happened last week? It's <laughs> <laughs> a minor meeting at the city at uh, Council Chambers. Get some good news coming out of it. Um, and uh, before we move on, I was going to talk about budget, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I was. Are we now in a mode where we, we need to do all the detailed work to prepare the bills? Is, <coughs> we are. When we hired CDM to do some of that. Yep. So CDM is CDM is uh, moving forward on their billing database for us, which would identify every parcel in the city that gets a bill. Yep. Their pervious area and impervious area in the calculation for them um, in order to get the bill. Okay. Um, so we're working on sort of that aspect of it. Um, Anne Marie Levy is working on Levy is working on uh, updating our Munis database system for the new utilities so we can figure out how to marry the information from the CDM database to get into Munis. Okay. Um, CDM is pretty far along. We had a meeting earlier this week at, with Anne Marie, and I think. Um, Everything is is feasible and doable in the time frames that we have, so we feel like that's going pretty well. Um, the, the budgets we've talked about a little bit. Um, there's a couple of loose ends on the budgets that we're trying to nail down, but we've got, we've got a pretty good budget on the stormwater flood control side now. So. Okay. When, when do we actually receive cash? Uh, right. Get the bill. He's beyond the bill. <laughs> can, we, are, can, can we send bills on on July one? So much immediate. I mean, fast as the mechanics work. You yeah, just to get your bill dated. You can make sure that that's the first. No, round. I just wondered what time period, <coughs> if the billing date was at the end, first of the quarter or the end of the quarter. I guess that's the basic question. Right. There was a cash flow question that's beyond the city engineer's knowledge, but I'm, <laughs> I've been assured that people smarter than me within the city have figured out how that little transition would occur. Right. At least that's what they claim. <laughs> well, it's a good, it is a good question because we're transitioning from general fund to, uh, to a new utility and we're just sending the bills out for the first time, so you start with no money in the bank. But the, the, the billing does go out with water and sewer. So in some of the planning meetings it was realized that there's no time to waste in terms of getting right. everything organized yeah. because the water and sewer bills go out on the schedule.
and I guess I, I missed it, but I guess there's, you've all already talked about the stormwater budget. Is that true or mm -hmm. not true? Yeah, true. True. Everyone was. Well, true, but but we're waiting for the indirect cost to see how it affects the overall budget. Right. We're still waiting for those costs. We can do that under informational item three later. And we did talk a little bit about the cash flow. Anything else on stormwater? Good. Um, oh yeah, there is one other thing. I'm sorry. I, I just heard uh, yesterday or today, I forget when, that the draft MS4 permit from EPA, the latest is that it's coming out in April. So it's been okay. delayed just month after month after month, but I've heard from them that it's supposed to be out in April. This year. <laughs> so they tell me. <coughs> okay. Well, actually, that'd be good. Uh, I mean, they would almost give us enough time to... Well, we're, we're going to budget as if it's going to be out. Right. Uh, next reuse committee and the reuse center. We, uh, I hear there's rumors that, that Susan's going to meet with you tomorrow, but the next meeting is on April the 3rd. The committee is all going to hold, trying to think of different ways to create a revolving fund. They're just full of ideas. They're really good ideas. I don't know if you kept up with all those emails. They're great. But I'm encouraging them to, as you um, uh, mentioned, to set up a budget and then make some suggestions on high budget, low budget, okay. and what they could legitimately do. But I have passed on the idea that we probably may have the land, uh, the transfer station for another year. That's open to discussion, but that's sort of the direction to like put it count on having a space on this particular. So that revolving fund's going to City Council next Thursday night for its first reading. Just so you're aware of that. Okay. This is for the reuse center? For the reuse committee. Mm -hmm. uh, for the reuse committee to be able to, my, it's my understanding they're looking to charge or people want to donate money to the committee for future projects mm -hmm. or future works or if they're renting a table space, they want the committee to keep the money. So we need to set this revolving fund to be able to do that. That way we can pay for advertising out of that fund also. Right. Right. So it's like two, two separate things. Right. But the idea that they have all these ideas for fundraising to go into the development fund is enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Things that have to do. Enthusiastic. Yeah, of course you've got that, your uh, fresh blood with David. So. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and the solid waste budget, is it? Where does that slot into the agenda tonight? Informational item three. Okay, great. Uh, well, then next, let's talk Pulaski Park. Working on a flyer. I've got some dates. I wanted to let the board know the dates. Um, I'm hoping to send the flyer out maybe at the end of this week or the beginning of next week. Um, yeah, pull that back. They're cheating us out of at least five minutes. They are, aren't hour. they? Yeah, because it was oh 55 God. minutes and then it was... That's not annoying. It's not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like okay. Is that better? The <laughs> there you go. Yes. Oh, We're old school around here. It's 11 o'clock. I'm trying to irritate you. <laughs> what was I saying? Rosemary. <laughs> Three days. <laughs> Three days. April 24th. May 22nd and June 26th. April 24th, May 22nd, 22nd and June 26th. 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 All Thursdays, all from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., all at the Senior Center um, for the design process for the park. <coughs> so we're hoping to have a widely distributed flyer that uh, we'll get out there so people will be aware of it. Um, I reached out earlier this week to uh, Andrew Crystal, who's the, uh, I don't know what his title is, Executive Director of the Academy of Music or something, to meet with him specifically about the concerns that they have about the park renovation and, and, and what they're uh, basically find out what they think about it so we can take that into account as we move ahead. I wanted to meet with him before the public meetings so that we were able to sort of get that as a baseline for what we're doing. And I traded. Uh, some email with Joe Blumenthal, who's been very interested in um, 
the sort of stage musical aspects potentially for the park. And um, I wanted to get his input. He had actually, the bid had paid for a, a sound report by Klondike Sound in terms of the best acoustics in the park, in terms of where to set up a stage and how that might work. So we're trying to take that into account as we go into the first meeting. Um, those are people that specifically reached out. Some other, there have been other people too, um, but I think it'll be great the first meeting on the 24th. We're gonna get some folks there and get, get everybody's ideas. Great. Private ways. No change from the last time we met. Um, basically we got um, 34 private ways moving through. Uh, 19 of them are in the city solicitor's hands at this point, uh, waiting for final takings or orders or whatever it's going to come out of that to start getting uh, the resident signatures and moving those to city council's packages. Uh, almost all the survey work is done at this point by Northeast Survey. Um, I'm supposed to put together with Ann this week, one of our engineers, and prepare to review five more plans that were just recently submitted also. So we're making, we're making headway. So has anything come back from the solicitor? No. Here. Yes. We had a lovely hearing this afternoon in Gale Force Winds. Where were we? Ridgeview? Ridgeview Road. Ridgeview Road. It was probably the best hearing we've ever attended. It lasted two minutes. <laughs> David ran it. He did a wonderful job. Well, had they already left or been yeah. blown into we the trees? Oh, okay. the All right. I knew I was, I was really late. He was still there and he thought you guys there. showed up after it was yeah. over? Yeah. Oh, well, nice. <laughs> well, I was way late. I was about five minutes late. I mean, well, I'm telling you. <laughs> you snooze, you lose. Sweet. You were really three minutes late. <laughs> I just mentioned to Chris that I thought that road has been there for like 10 years. No. This was created, I think, about three years ago. Wasn't there a gravel road that was in there for a long time? There might have been a woods road back in there, yeah. Well, it's a lot of open space at this point. There's a lot of conservation there with it. With the yeah, there's. I saw that posted. <coughs> okay. Moving on to the DPW budget. So we're waiting for the indirects to come in from uh, the, the business manager Susan Wright. We haven't seen those yet, and that's kind of the final touches that we're waiting to see on the budgets to present back to you. There is one outstanding thing I did want to have a conversation about tonight, which is the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund budget. And the board needs to make a decision how we're going to close the gap of that loss, that projected loss that we have. Right now, the projected loss is $101,607, the best of our knowledge that we anticipate we'll be losing. There were some additional ways that we could create additional revenue by uh, increasing the sticker prices. If we were to increase it to $50, that would make up $82,500 of it, assuming that we kept all the current customers that we have. That's probably the biggest means of making up the money that we currently losing. 82500 with the $50 uh, That's sticker correct. price increase. I just want to $50 price. On currently it's 25. So an increase of 25. Right, yeah. and the second okay. car is $5. Um, we didn't have a discussion whether or not we wanted to increase the second vehicle to $10. There's not that many of them sold a few hundred. Yeah, I don't understand the capital item, $225. That's money that's been encumbered. That's money that we have already secured on the books from previous years so, so do we have the money or is it just the it's in the fund budget? it's in the fund it just shows up that we're encumbering it yes we have the money we have the money we have the money it's in the fund. So, so why is it in here as an expense yeah that confused me i i added three numbers together and we shouldn't be adding the capital into our well i think that's but apparently that's how we're supposed to do it. Yeah, 
It shouldn't be out. I don't have my calculator. And I've talked to Dave Oliver about this. Yeah. 647-600. Our, so the 125,000, delete that, and suddenly we make a tiny profit. No. Well, what 125? Equipment vehicles? Is that what we're talking about? That? that the capital. Those three, three items. Oh, all three of those are have been in, encumbered, no. and we've already collected that money from previous years? Right. But so they're not included in the calculation of profit and loss. That's right. Uh, That's right. It looks like they are, but they're, they're, they're not. not. All they do is they take the back side, the number from the back the side. 288 plus the 230. Put the paper over. That's the labor cost. And then they add it to the 230,000. Right. Oh, it's two sides. Oh. <laughs> well, who knew? Oh, Wait a minute. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, I have to say I'm, I'm troubled at the thought we would go into this knowing in advance if, if, if one were to be a, a, to bet, you'd probably bet that we're going to fall short of our revenue projections. And to go into it anticipating that even if everything works perfectly, we're going to lose $100,000 seems uh, problematic. Well, I think the decision is for the next year, we would get more data if we continued to run the facility in the way that we did um, this past year. There's obviously a hole of 100,000. You could make that hole potentially smaller by increasing the fees, as Ned has indicated, to make it some some lesser number, 40 or 50,000 possibly. And then that hole would be filled with the free cash money that exists in the solid waste enterprise fund, which as of right now is about $1.9 million. So you can see why the mayor would be reluctant to transfer general fund money over to this account in the short run when there's that amount of free cash in the enterprise fund and it would allow another year to evaluate how the system is functioning? I think it would be very important not to raise the sticker prices because I think if you raise it, it just torpedoes the future. It really creates a new incentive for people to leave. I'm not suggesting that they be raised. It's just a decision that the board needs to make. If you want to try to ra if you want to try to close the gap through revenue, the only way to raise revenue is to raise what the vehicle permit fees are and the bag fees. Right. But but there's still a gap. It's not as though it fixes it. Right. And in fact, I think it does irrevocable damage. Right. Uh, yeah. The flip side of that would be to try to raise revenue, and that would be. Um, to lower the bag fee, you know, or to do uh, some other adjustment that, or allow uh, non-residents to purchase Northampton stickers. That would be, for instance, anyone coming from, and I really have no idea what's going on up, up Route 9, but um, if this is a shorter drive to get rid of the trash here versus driving to East Hampton, I, I think that's worth looking at, too, before we something really. I don't think there's a lot of money there, but I think it's a mean, positive step. Yeah, there's I don't no know. Reason I, I exactly, but even if we raise the sticker fee by twice, you know, by 100%, <coughs> we're only going to cut our deficit by, what, 18,000? No, 82,000. It would cut it by 82,000? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, I heard that. Didn't we used to have a higher sticker or vehicle fee? No. No? No. 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 It was $8? It was $10. $10. I believe it's $5 when I first started buying it. Yes, sir. Oh, well, what are the sticker prices in other towns, do we know? West Hampton 60, Williamsburg, I believe, is 100. Well, there I, you go. So we have hit our $25 tick sticker in West Hampton. And I would say in the, in the name of neighborliness. Yes. Uh, opening up our system to other communities that are, in fact, having probably these very similar conversations about how they manage their solid waste management budgets <laughs> um, might not be so neighborly <laughs> if we draw off customers from other communities that have dropped Leaflets all over their towns. <laughs> it would be controversial. <laughs> on the phone polls. Yes. I mean, we could do it differently. But, <laughs> but, but the idea, I'm sorry, just one more thing about that. Oh, out in front with the, <laughs> with the Statue of Liberty. Yes, in the yeah, that guy. That guy. You could do it in East Hampton because they, I don't think they have a drop-off, right? So there wouldn't be a 
There wouldn't be a war with uh, with East Hampton. Right, but it would seem unlikely that anyone from East Hampton would be dispose of their it trash without buying a sticker, buy our sticker. I just, my question is what, who can tell me what pickup costs are with, if you have alternative recycling, pick up the trash or whatever, what those, that annual fee is. Oh geez, it's like 300 a month. I mean, you, who has it? Somebody here must have it. I mean, what do you pay, Terry? You're all not wrong. Your trash. I dumped the trash you? at my father's condo. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Did oh, you get that? Did you get yeah. that? <laughs> I pay the condo fee also. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess this is a philosophical question, but Come, what? I, I want to make sure that we. Uh, I'm sorry. Is there yeah. no answer to this one? Well, uh, Jim, Jim has a reasonable guess. Yeah. I think it's around three hundred dollars or a more. Year? Yeah, a, year. a year. A year. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. Um. What happens if we don't do anything? What happens if we say we're going to keep things exactly the same? What 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 does the city do next? So we'll we'll lose money again, right? And then a year from now, when we're sitting here, Jim, you'll you feel like we'll have good a good basis for shutting down the program. This is not my idea. I mean, this is you know, that that's the option that we're faced with, really, um, because the mayor doesn't want to expend general funds on this particular system for at least another year so that we can see get get another year of data how the system works and then possibly have another discussion about ways to deal with solid waste management in the city because here's my point and and this came up i've actually been thinking about this over the last week um and i think jim was the person who raised it why does this have to operate at profit why is this not a fundamental function of local government where it ought to be paid for by the city. It's, it's not required by state. It's not an essential municipal service. That may Probably. or may not be true. Yes, so it, is true. it is true. It is true. But that's, again, that's sort of not the point. Well, that historically has been the position of city hall. Okay. Don't, don't look to us for money. Okay. All right. That, that's what I need to do. Yeah. And that's been yeah. confirmed over. And okay. Um, multiple part question first is uh, I'm having trouble following some of the numbers in the revenue section okay. um, so we ought to be comfortable with that but the bigger point is um, we really have like, we have two options one is status quo uh, we lose a projected hundred thousand dollars and we're in this position next year with some better data but not knowing what the impact of increasing any fees would be. Our other option is to increase some fees, lose some more customers, but at least a year from now, we'll know what the impact of increasing the fees is and how significant it is. And, and I think in either case, we're, we're gonna be in the same predicament a year from now. That this cannot sustain itself and we have to make a decision, the city has to make a decision, not just us, as, as to whether we continue to operate at a deficit and and erode away our balance or, or we just terminate the program. And the newest member of the recycling committee? No, I would just say it, it gives us a year to, to, to convince the city and, and they, they'll have plenty of notice to either fund it or drop it. Well, but we, we have two ways of doing that. One is status quo or <coughs> raise the fee. And I guess I'd be inclined to raise the fee as an attempt to bring this yeah. program. You know, what, what's a responsible thing for us to do? Well, bring it into bring it into a break-even situation or as close as we think we dare. We think the revenues are, are pretty, um, they're based on projections and what we've seen through, well, we, we, when we did the projections, we based on, we based on the mid-year numbers and then projected through the end of the year. I mean, I think we're, we're fairly confident in terms of how those are going to play out. Um, I haven't double checked all of it. There's a, a variety of scenarios on bumping up different st vehicle sticker fees. I actually haven't checked all those numbers. And I couldn't explain them, but it's basic math. How many do we think we're going to sell and what's the increased value of those? Well, I agree with Mike, um, although I think that the relationship of, I've always felt that as residents we should take care of our own trash, but we don't have a landfill any longer, so we're in a whole new situation. 
my issue is now because the reuse committee is working so hard to find ways as both a community service and a, and a service for um, reuse and recycle, you know, making less trash for landfills no matter where they are, that do we want to not allow them to have money to go toward a recycling center um, and that and continue to lose money on the salary fund or do we want to maybe look into trying to find ways to fund a reuse center or a reuse organization with and with the ensuing events that do create um, support for sustainability in our um, in our community and also creates community building as as an end in itself. So by raising fees, we get more information. We see what that demand curve shows. By taking potential losses that would just be going down the uh, drain and assigning it to or investing it in reuse makes me more comfortable. I was going to ask along those same lines, is there a line item in here that is the place where the reuse committee could draw, not a lavish budget, but if they need 500 bucks for this or 1000 bucks for that, is that in one of these line items where that money would come from? Pretty bare bones budget at this point. I'll agree with that. So it would have to, it would be coming out of the ways and places of way, which was what the solid waste reuse committee from three years ago that the mayor put together was. We want a reuse center, and if we need to raise the fees for it, then maybe we need that something to consider. So the spreadsheet that you're looking at it was sort of the analysis that was done to figure out what the break even is. And that's why, you know, the encumbrances thing gets a little confusing because it's jammed in there. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's missing is the $1.9 million in free cash that exists in the overall solid waste enterprise fund. This is a bare bone budget that's designed to reflect the revenue that would be raised by the operation of the transfer station and the costs that we would incur to run it. But there's money in the overall solid waste enterprise fund that's left over from the landfill operation that's that's almost $2 million. But if, if, if for example, we decided to spend $2,000 uh, creating this reuse center for paint or maybe some carpentry or electrical work or something. Right. And we, if it were to come out of that surplus, would they require the city council to specifically approve taking some money out of that? Almost it's put in the budget. Right. Yes. You mean at this point? Yes. Yeah, it needs to go in here or it's going to take a federal act yes. to pull out the money. Yeah. Well, I would support putting some funding in there. <coughs> Well, sure, you're on the committee. Who else would like to be on the committee? So we have two competing thoughts. We have the idea that we can put a line item in the budget for the reuse center and committee. We have the idea that we could also raise sticker, sticker prices in order to see how elastic that amount is and give us additional information for the next year. Could you repeat again what our neighbors are charging? Williamsburg and sixty dollars and West Hampton sixty, and I believe Williamsburg is a hundred. Wow! And what do they get for that? Is that a free use? Or no, you still pay by the bag. You still pay. And for items like tires, you pay per item. Right. And their bag charges are <coughs> similar. I don't know about Williamsburg. I know West Hampton is um, dollar a large bag, fifty for a small bag. Fifty cents. Ashfield is two dollars a bag. I I <clears throat> I I would argue that Mike is right. We we have there's a good case I think to be made for not simply sitting on our hands for two years and saying there goes two years data. It's we tried this for a year and then we made some adjustments. We tried that for a year. I mean there's you know some reflection and thought that went into the process. Here's, you know, if we go back to the city hall 
next year and say, okay, here's what we got so far. <coughs> this is where we're at. I, I think that makes sense. Did we hold off doing bagging or the um, sticker increase last year? Yes, we did. We did. Is that it? We kept, kept the plan. And in fact, there was a calculation at one point that said the sticker ought to be $75. Yes, mm -hmm. yes that's right. And $75 would make this a more than break even proposition. Mm -hmm. Nice job, by the way. Yeah, well, break even. So Don't you raise the back fee to three? But that's where we were. But so. we, oh, we just did it, though, recently, right? Right. right. Yeah. Was it last year? Yeah. Last year? yeah. yeah. <coughs> and we could go to 305. Right. right. I mean, now we can. 317. Yeah. Do I hear 325? That's the beauty of the banks. I think we ought to just focus on. Well, keep it simple. I, okay. I, I, I think so. Yeah. Plus, okay. we, we do have a competitor in town. You know. Well, I prefer to think of it as somebody that does offer to the residents alternatives. Okay. <laughs> So we have someone in town that offers alternatives at a lower cost. <laughs> all right, so this is still all in flux, right? That's a fun board you haven't approved it yet. It's not really all in flux. I mean, those are the numbers that we're recommend. These aren't crazy jumpy numbers, they're, jumping beam they're numbers. Not, well, they're although, they're not. At, at some point I'd like an explanation of the, the revenue math, because I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And, and perhaps and we could find a, a line item for the reuse center. Right. And I think the staff needs to know whether we want to build in a higher sticker price so that when they work up the budget there, they have a different number. That's correct. So is there um, consensus that we like the idea of a higher sticker price? Something yes. that will get us into yeah. the ballpark of yeah. breaking. Yes. Yeah. 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 So if we kept the current number of stickers for every five dollar increase, it adds about sixteen thousand five hundred in revenue. For every five dollars increase. Right. So if you went to forty dollars, which would be a fifteen dollar increase, that would generate almost fifty thousand dollars in additional revenue. But that won't get us where we need to go. It doesn't break you either. Right. So we need about fifty five or sixty bucks. Probably. Sixty. Um. And what, oh, okay, I want to know one more piece of information. Um, when do we have to have a budget by? The mayor has to have it to the city council 45 days in advance of the close of the fiscal year. So in mid-May, we were hoping that the board would be approving all the budgets on April 9th. Oh, okay. That was my goal. We, but we have to, that's dependent upon getting the indirect cost by right. um, the additional piece of information I was looking for is like we know two communities do we know other communities and their sticker prices we do well, we had handouts in the past through Karen and yes. board that there's a running list that yes I don't know I just don't have it's a year old at this yet. point I understand We can get that for you. But if I mean, if if that fifty dollars is in the middle to lower part of that, then we're in line with other communities. That helps. I mean, that it would take about sixty to uh, make this a break even, which is still right in there with. It's in line with mm -hmm. the local hotel communities. What they're charging. I don't know about Amherst or Hadley. I don't know off the top of my head about Amherst or Hadley. But I will get you that information. Okay, yeah. So, so this could come back <laughs> at our next meeting? Well, his point is his next meeting is when he'd like to have the final budget. As soon as I get the as soon as I get the indirects from downtown, I'm planning to hold another morning meeting 
Okay. So they'll go through all this. Right. Okay. okay. Right. That way, the ninth, hopefully, that we have everything together. You just <coughs> approve. That makes a lot of sense. So did that make sense? What I said about the reuse building. So we need to put five thousand dollars in. You can do that. Yeah. Five thousand. Yeah. We'll build it in. Makes sense. Do it as well. Well. That's better than nothing. I think so. Mm. Any other? Anything else? Okay. So we're, we're going to get together some morning. Yep, that's the plan. Good. Uh, Gary, anything? Oh. Well. I was going to wait till the end, but it went got around to me. But any did that guy's discussion about the rainbow crosswalk and all the letters and why not green crosswalk <coughs> for Irish? Does that spark any discussion? Are we well, it it certainly occurred to me that we're creating a precedent, and that it might be more challenging for us to deal with another group with a different agenda that wanted to decorate our city street, perhaps with an agenda that the community doesn't support as substantially. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we could turn that one down, especially this board, because we don't view us as taking on that political consideration in our decisions. We had asked for uh, uh, Melinda Shaw to get in touch with the mayor's office and other people within the city to get buy-in from everybody. So I, I had asked her that. So when, when she came here and we had a discussion about what, what she was doing, um, uh, we had actually overlooked the MUTCD thing, which I apologize for. I didn't, I didn't pick that up. It was picked up in transportation and parking, I understand. The design has been changed to reflect meeting the requirements of MUTCD. Two feet, two feet, two feet. Yes, so the design as it stands meets that. So the way I've personally been looking at this is that the board and the department are looking at the crosswalk from a technical standpoint and that the mayor's office and other people that get into these issues of, well, should we have the Finnish flag across you know, the street that I live on because my dad was from Finland, I don't know we can, that's the mayor's decision or somebody else's decision other than the board. Um, so he asked questions, should have gone through the city council. You know, I don't really have any idea, but the idea behind getting the mayor's office involved was to sort of get the political consideration of it away from us so that we could just focus on, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to do a crosswalk, can it be done, how would we do it, how would we pay for it, more sort of that type of thing. Um, but, you know. So you're thinking of circling back to Melinda, or? I'm not going to circle back to anybody. Um, because Melinda s spoke with the mayor, the mayor's office has approved the idea. Um, it's not up to, I don't think it's up to us to figure out whether there should have been some other political process, a city council vote. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's clearly not what I would do every day. Yeah. And do we do we have a timeline? I mean, are we, did we, is this like, so this is not in perpetuity. Mm. We're not, we're not committing to painted rainbow for the rest of time. We haven't committed to perpetuity. There was some discussion about whether money could be raised to keep it painted in that fashion. Um, I think the, the discussion that was held here was, can we do it? She would raise money so that it could be done this year for the Pride Parade in May. That was pretty much the discussion. Um, I saw other things, you know, on, on the internet and stuff about maybe making it, you know, making it sort of a standing crosswalk there, but I don't think that that certainly wasn't anything I really discussed or anything I think the board discussed or probably would require another consideration. So is it fair to say it would come back to us in a year when it's time to redo that crosswalk? I would think so. I mean, I mean did, what does the board think? I mean, did, was it your under, un, under your impression when you took, when you supported it that, that it would be in perpetuity or that it would just be I kind of thought it was. I mean, the materials, I mean, the discussion of the materials was long-lasting, you know, not thermoplastic, but 
the best we could find up until that point. So it seemed to me like it was a commitment to the long term. Which, you know, next time we pay the street, maybe it'll change, but that's like in perpetuity. <laughs> My main question was, <laughs> did it follow federal highway guidelines? Yeah, apparently not. It does. It does. No, it does. It does. Said that it did. Oh, he's he looked oh, it so up. He was oh, it does now. It does now. It does now because you changed the width. We missed it. You I didn't missed change it. the width. It came, up, came up at transportation and parking, and then yeah. it was redesigned to meet the. Yeah. Measure. It came up as being enforceable by the Northampton Police Department as being a true crosswalk. So we did is we modified the existing pattern so that we could get the two foot wide white bars in mm -hmm. between the colored bars so it would make the meeting at METCDA as a crosswalk. Oh, so it's going to be white and red. That's, and that's correct. Uh -huh. So it's what's going to be painted. You could say that it's a, it's a standard crosswalk, METC crosswalk, instead of pavement, uh -huh. you have color. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So yes. what I remember within the last couple of years, somebody else coming and talking about decorative crosswalks, and I don't remember the details. They wanted to do go, have us go back to the transverse lines or the horizontal lines going completely across the pavement and painting in between these two horizontal lines. As an art project. That's yeah, correct. Fish. Well, so I have, I have an idea. I, I think that we can say that we're, we're sticking with an UTC, whatever it is, design standard but we will allow anybody to paint in between. Why wouldn't we do that? For whatever reason, because we're an arts community, among other things. And this mm -hmm. is just a, a first example, and it's been it's been on the table in the past, and I don't remember why it, it didn't happen, but it- Because it's it, horizontal. Yeah, we, we wanted the METCD, whatever it is, standard. It's called, <laughs> it's called the ladder. The ladder is called. Um, and so I, I think we should be open to as long, and, and I think the thing with the uh, standard is that there's contrast. So the white gives you the contrast, and it's a recognizable. You re everybody identifies that as a crosswalk. So if there's color in between, I, I don't see the problem because pavement could be gray, it could be black, it could be. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it depends on the aggregate that goes into the mix. Well, I don't think this is an art project. You know, if, if for our projects, we could ask some art committee in the city to, to look over it. This is more more of a political statement. Yeah. And and so uh, I think we've opened the door to that. Well, I yeah, I, I think that we would certainly be approached by people who had an, a political agenda, but I think having them get approval from the mayor's office first, I think right. is, that's how that works. Yep. I, um, I think okay that always that. would have to be the would be part of that process. And I think as long as we're clear about that and, and how this particular crosswalk got approved, then somebody who has a desire to do something else, then they, they, they have a path. They have a way they can go. Are there any second thoughts about the idea that this might be in perpetuity, more or less? Is that I, I didn't have a strong feeling that was in perpetuity because everybody knows that, that even the best paint eventually has to be replaced and, and, and that the, this entity is paying for <coughs> that paint. I think we're, we're volunteering the labor, but I think the cost of the paint is coming from right. whoever raised the money for it. I think that's the way it would have to be. I don't think we can do it in perpetuity. We can just and when the white lines need painting, that's our responsibility to paint them. And if the other ones don't get painted, they don't get painted. We still have the contrast. But it would come back to us before the colored stuff, the colored paints get re redone. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't think Melinda said that she could raise money for the rest of the time to keep these things right. painted. And we didn't offer to spend city resources to do the painting, so. Um, they created a gift account downtown for this. Right, they're accepting donations at City Hall, and she set up a Facebook page for donations. I have a check for a hundred on my desk from someone in Brimfield, so people are contributing. We should set up a gift account for Pothole. Perpetual We should. <laughs> <laughs> perpetual Pothole we'll, we'll, we'll paint that Pothole gas full of different colors. <laughs> <coughs> 
Did you, did you ride your bike? Uh, I brought my bike. <laughs> and then walked it into the wind. Car. <laughs> all right. Well, um, okay. So that's all. I just, I just wanted to touch on that. So it sounds like it'll come before us again before they get the colors get refreshed. Gary, anything else? No, I'm exhausted. Chris? I'm good. Um, I did have one item. Back, back when we had our first meeting on um, capital projects, we were handed the summary of the Tate and Howard report on the water system. And I don't recall even where we are in the preparation of the report, if it's a done deal or not, but there's a lot of information in this summary we were given that I don't really understand, and I'd like an opportunity to understand it better. And I don't know whether that's something other people here would like to do in a, in a session, or uh, I don't know the right way to do it, but I certainly <coughs> felt like there, there are recommendations to do a lot of work here, and I really don't understand the real importance of them and the alternatives that were considered. So where's that report? Report's done. Done. Happy to talk about it. Okay. So th we've we've got the formal final product. Okay. We we could do a whole meeting. Up. I I think it's a special single topic meeting. Yeah. Because we need maps and we need to get oriented on where all the elements of the system are and how all these recommendations fit into it. We spent about a three quarters of a million dollars on this. No. No? Half? No. No? Fifty dollars? <laughs> it was about seventy-five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the sewer one. A little one. more than the new sticker. Yeah, the sewer one is uh, almost a million. This one was... Uh, oh, right. Uh, yeah, it was a lot less. I forget the number. Okay. Still, this is a big report. Do you want to schedule a meeting, uh, like a, for a presentation to the board to talk about it? Or but can't we have it on a regular board night? It's up to you. I mean, you tell me when you want to have it. We'll we have. We'll, we'll have to wait till after budget season. <coughs> yeah, I mean, clearly May 9th is or April 9th is taken. Maybe late late April, mm -hmm. early May. Sure. I mean, it could be like an hour to go, to go through. That's what I was thinking. It, 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 it'll take at least a Yeah, long. and then well, knock off the contracts. And <laughs> but we love Rich. <laughs> well, I want to know about our water supply. I want to know about our water supply. Sure, okay. Our water. So we could do that uh, late April, early May? Sure. I mean, if I can talk to the city council about forestry for an hour, we can certainly oh. talk about the water system. <laughs> Bill said you were spellbinding. Spellbinding. Who was sleeping through it? <laughs> yeah. Somebody, friend of yours? So they went pretty well. That's what they. That's what people say. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard when you're doing all the yapping to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Great. Right. Right. Um. So, Mike. So we have received um, a letters from FEMA that we are being obligated to the tune of about 1.6 million dollars in reimbursable money for the. River Road Retaining Fall Project nice. and the uh, Slope Stabilization Project along Zane Beach. Those two projects together is about $2.1 million is the engineer's estimate for design, permitting, and construction. And like I said, we've been obligated 75% reimbursement, which is great news. So the new stormwater fund can pay for the work and then we re recoup the 75%. And the money in the stormwater fund. Um. All right. Jim, you got nothing. BJ. What's that? MJ. I heard about potholes. I'm happy. <laughs> nothing new. No. I'm good. Good. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion.